I'm Inger Damon. On, on behalf of CDC, I want to welcome everyone to the second meeting of the Interagency MECFS Work Group. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Director of the Division of High Consequence Pathogens and Pathology at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And this division is the home of CDC's MECFS program in the Chronic Viral Disease Branch. CDC and NIH brought this group together to create a forum to share information across multiple federal agencies. The agencies represented here support research on MECFS and or have an interest in issues that impact the lives of individuals with MECFS. Depending on the topic, we also invite participants from patient advocacy groups and patients themselves to share information about how to further, re re further research on MECFS. Based on the Federal Advisory Committee Act, this working group is not considered a federal advisory committee and therefore cannot make recommendations to the agencies involved. The working group can identify opportunities to increase our knowledge of MECFS and ways to work together to find solutions to help individuals affected by this terrible disease. The goal of this working group is to increase communication and collaboration amongst federal agencies and with stakeholders. And the agencies will provide brief updates on their related efforts and will focus on a specific topic to advance their programs and ECFS activities. To ensure we're meeting the goals of this community, it's important that we hear from those most affected by MECFS and get input and feedback. So we'll provide time during each of the meetings for us to respond to questions that come in from the community. I've been director of this division since 2014, and I've been a member of this division since I came to CDC in 1999. Several scientists from my division and office of director have participated in various MECFS work groups, discussion groups, and federal advisory committees in the past. We're excited to engage in this effort to continue to discuss what is going on across the agencies and how we as government scientists can help support the science moving forward to understand this disease, how to diagnose it, how to treat it, and perhaps even how to prevent it. Um, I'm happy to serve as co-chair of the group along with Dr. Koroshetz from NIH, and I'd like to thank Drs. Unger and Whittemore for their work in organizing this meeting. And I'd especially like to thank those who are participating today and look forward to the discussions throughout this afternoon and tomorrow afternoon. The goal of today's meeting is to discuss MECFS healthcare workforce development, documentation of the need, the challenges from the clinical and the clinician's viewpoint, and the current initiatives that address that need. The goal of tomorrow's meeting is to update the community on research activities and cross-agency collaborations for long COVID. The federal agencies participating include the National Institutes of Health, Social Security Administration, Veterans Affairs, Department of Defense's Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare and Medicaid Services, and CDC. We welcome participation of several guests, including representatives from Massachusetts MECFS and FM Association, ME Action, New Jersey MECFS Association, Solve MECFS Initiative, and presentations from the National Association of School Nurses, Quinnipiac University, MECFS Clinician Coalition, Nova Southeastern University, and the Long COVID Alliance. We'll use the start of each session for introductions of speakers. After the discussions um, at the end of each session, we'll take questions from listeners. If you'd like to ask a question, please click on the Q&A button and type your question in the box, then click submit. We'll read out the questions and panelists will answer them. We'll prioritize questions related to the day's topic and hope to answer as many as possible during the meetings. If you have any technical issues, please type your issue in the chat box for help and Monica will provide assistance. A recording of the meeting along with the agenda and the list of participants will be posted to the MECFS website after the conclusion of the meeting. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Koroshetz from the NIH for some, for some additional introductory remarks. Dr. Koroshetz. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. Oh, uh, thank everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Damon and the CDC for hosting this important meeting. We'd first like to welcome Dr. Catherine Argue, who is the new representative from the Department of Defense's Congressional Directed Medical Research Program. Uh, she is currently managing the MECFS awards under the peer-reviewed medical research program. So welcome, Catherine. 
received a lot of positive feedback following the first uh, working group meeting. And we think this is a really useful venue to help us increase collaboration among the federal agencies and to hear from stakeholders uh, interested in MECFS research uh, going forward. We also want to take a moment to thank the patient advocacy groups who have agreed to participate in the meeting. Um, the, the groups work together with uh, lots of folks and we look forward to hearing their presentation today and tomorrow on these important issues. Uh, we appreciate the group's participation and the essential patient perspective that they bring to the meeting. Um, it's all about trying to uh, get relief for people who are suffering. Um, uh, and we're also aware uh, that the main topic for this meeting is trying to see what can be done about improving uh, health care for people suffering with MECFS, particularly around the issue of expertise and interest of healthcare care providers with the experience and expertise in MECFS. It's a critical topic for discussion with this group. And we're excited to hear your ideas. Uh, later this afternoon, Dr. Vicki Whittemore will speak to you about training awards trying to get young people interested in MECFS through research and fellowship op research fellowship opportunities supported by NIH. Um, but clearly that's just a, a small piece of what's needed, which is uh, much more awareness and interest on the part of uh, primary care physicians and different specialists um, uh, taking care of folks. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to the meeting and uh, like to turn it back now to Dr. Damon. Uh, actually, probably all. Uh, this is Beth Unger. Oh, yeah, um, Beth. yeah. Unger. and Sorry. I will start off the the session and try to explain the way we've organized this uh, agenda. We ask the um, the uh, several of the uh, patient advocacy groups to work together to uh, give a presentation. So, to set the stage for uh, the need for healthcare um, and the need uh, for workforce development. And then we will move to the challenges that are faced by clinicians trying to meet that need. And then we'll have a break and then we'll talk about some uh, initiatives that are and have been done to try to address this. And then we'll uh, have a, a, a bigger discussion about uh, how we can move forward. And then we have a small amount of uh, other uh, business. So for our first presentation, I would like to invite uh, the presentation by Ovid Amate. And he is speaking on behalf of all of the, um, the advocate organizations. And we have Ben Suberger, who's uh, representing ME Action. Charmian Proskauer, who's representing Mass MECFS, and um, sorry, and Ken Friedman, who's representing uh, New Jersey MECFS Association. So, Ovid, if you could. Thank, thank you very much. Um, do, um, uh, uh, do I show my, my own slides or? No, um, I think that Monica, you have the slides. That was my understanding. No. Uh, yes, give me one second. Sure. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, first, I would like to, to thank the organizers uh, for inviting us to share the community's perspective on the admit needs and the barriers to care for persons with uh, MECFS. My name is Oded Amitai, and I serve as president of Solve um, ME. Next slide, please. So I'm honored to speak today on behalf of our organizations um, in, represent, in representing the MECFS community. Together, uh, we bring international, national, and state-level perspectives that were formed over many years. 
I'd like to thank the many advocates who contribute to this presentation um, and to the Massachusetts uh, MECFS and the Fibromyalgia Association, ME Action, uh, New Jersey MECFS Association, and SolveME, the organizations who work together to uh, prepare these slides. Next slide, please. So in this form, I probably don't really need uh, to describe what myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, or MECFS as we refer to it, um, is. I'd like to uh, only point out the complexity of this disease, um, coupled with the lack of uh, commonly available diagnostics and uh, the fact that there are no approved treatments, are ultimately at the root of many of the barriers to care that we'll discuss today. So, um, as you've already said, uh, Dr. Korsh, it's making diagnostics, treatments, and ultimately a cure become a reality really remain the key unmet needs for people with um, MECFS. Next slide, please. So together we stand for people living with MECFS who need support and access to compassionate and effective care. Um, sadly, I'm here today to bring uh, the voice of a concerned community. Not only we, uh, we are concerned about the current unmet needs um, and the barriers that we'll talk about uh, for the estimated 2 million people in the US who are affected uh, by MECFS, the majority of whom cannot really work or even fully live, uh, live their lives. And uh, concern about the barriers uh, to care that have been in place for such a long time. But at the same time, we're, uh, we also feel deep angst about a near future that may possibly double the number of Americans suffering uh, from MECFS with the surge in number of people who are not recovering from COVID-19. So just imagine the impact on so many people their families and the societal impact that that would have. Next slide, please. So, so how does MECFS relate to long COVID um, um, and other chronic diseases? Well, there's still obviously so much that we don't know about SARS-CoV-2, uh, the virus itself, and COVID-19. But at this point, it's, uh, it's evident that a subset of people who had COVID-19 go on to have symptoms that are very similar to MECFS. And some of them meet the diagnostic criteria for MECFS, regardless of the case definition that you may use. So while we don't know uh, that these diseases are the same, we understand that people with MECFS um, and that the subset of long COVID share similar needs and face essentially the same barriers to care that we will describe, uh, that we will talk about today. So we know enough to understand the urgency in which we must act. We believe that an integrated um, approach is needed and, um, um, and, and that really uh, the way to, uh, to address it is by thinking about both communities um, at, the same, uh, at the same time. So we were therefore very encouraged uh, to read Director Collins' announcement yesterday about the newly, uh, the newly formed uh, NIH post-acute sequelae uh, infection or the PASC as, uh, as it's known initiative. We totally agree that the insight uh, we gained from long COVID research will also enhance our understanding of other diseases with similar symptoms such as MECFS. Likewise, prior knowledge in the MECFS space should inform this initiative. And in fact, addressing these diseases and the respective communities uh, disjointedly has the potential to, uh, to have harmful consequences. Next slide, please. So with that said, uh, let's focus on the experiences of the MECFS community. Uh, this, is this slide is just a reminder that uh, for people like myself who don't have uh, the, long, uh, the longer history, um, it's a reminder that there has been a comprehensive report that was done back in 2013 uh, through the FDA's initiative. It's a very, uh, it's a very uh, a recommended read. Unfortunately, from the perspective of people with MECFS, um, not much has changed since that time. Next slide, please. So um, as Dr. Unger uh, asked us uh, to look at the barriers and the challenges more specifically, we wanted to have a more accurate and granular understanding of, uh, of what the community is facing. So let's look at data that was analyzed by the Massachusetts MECFS Association. 
Um, they provide direct support to individuals uh, that may or that do have MECFS and are seeking healthcare. So as part of this analysis, we reviewed roughly 1,000 requests from the past five years to identify the most prevalent challenges. As you can see on the graph uh, on the right-hand side, the overwhelming majority of people face challenges that uh, are at the very early stages of their journey. These have to do mostly with health, uh, with access to healthcare providers who are either experts or knowledgeable enough about, uh, about the disease and certainly who don't dismiss them with this belief. The barriers at later stages include coordination of care, documentation of disability, and inadequate social service support. We'll explore these major categories in the following slides using direct quotes uh, from the people who, uh, who were seeking, um, seeking assistance. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> access to knowledgeable providers is really the most prevalent unmet need and the barrier to care. And while we would like to see uh, many more experts, um, the basic truth is that, uh, that any sufficiently knowledgeable health healthcare provider can validate the experience a person is going through, avoid harmful information that is still out there, uh, and provide support. So when we consider the workforce development, it is not only about experts, but really getting to the primary care physician, uh, physicians as well. Next slide, please. This whole number of experts nationally creates a very limited access uh, to their expertise. Practically, as you can see in this quote, many people are facing long waiting periods that can be many months or even, uh, or even a year before they can see a knowledgeable physician, let alone an MECFS -E expert. Next slide. Next slide, please. This belief um, is one of the most difficult aspects of MECFS. Many people with MECFS face disbelief in their own families or, work, or workplace, but the dismissal by a healthcare provider is particularly hurtful and can lead to a long lasting damage. As this person says here, if there's anything worse than going through this is not having anyone believe me. Next slide, please. So we'll hear later on uh, from Mary, uh, Mary Dimick about the challenges of the medical education. Uh, and this is just so critical because if providers were sufficiently educated about MECFS, even without being experts, there is still a lot that they could do. On the diagnostic side, certainly even, uh, um, even with, uh, without the, uh, uh, the, full, uh, the full expertise in the disease, they could expedite the diagnosis. Uh, by breaking silos and communicating with other, um, other people on the care team. Uh, they could certainly try treatments that have, uh, that have provided benefits for some patients, although they are not uh, indicated uh, for any CFS. Next slide, please. So the diagnostic odyssey can take years uh, in some cases, and that really remains a major barrier. Uh, that takes a significant toll, a toll personally and financially. The results could be uh, devastating as uh, you can uh, see here in this quote. Um, right now, everyone is just pushing pain med meds on me and side drugs. And that's a very, re that's a very uh, a, a painful reality for so many people. So reaching a diagnosis more quickly could help to avoid years of agony and wasted resources. Next slide, please. Children and young people uh, with MECFS um, face, uh, and MECFS face particular challenges uh, as they often have uh, less autonomy for sure. But parenting a child with MECFS brings the need to coordinate care while working uh, dealing with financial burden and, of course, the frustration that's caused by, by the disbelief as described by this parent. Everyone treats her daughter like this is psychosomatic and she cannot get any accommodations at school. This continues to be very, very painful, of course, for the children and the parents. Next slide, please. 
So obviously cost is a major concern for most people. Uh, the data suggests that individuals diagnosed with MECFS um, had insured medical costs that were four times higher than those in the general population. So that gives us a context to understand what the burden of specialty care expenses, specialized tests, drugs, and supplements that are not covered by insurance might be. And of course, uh, it, uh, it may lead in many cases uh, for people to completely exhaust their financial resources. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, about three quarters of people with MECFS, uh, based on the data that we have, cannot maintain a job due to their condition. Therefore, many of the community do not have employment provided healthcare uh, insurance and, uh, and only rely on Medicaid. Unfortunately, many doctors don't accept Medicaid, uh, which leaves uh, very few options uh, to access care that uh, the people uh, need so, uh, so badly. Next slide, please. So um, disability is a particularly sensitive topic. Um, and while being on disability is not something that uh, people would choose for themselves to begin with, even getting the correct documentation to support disability claim uh, proves to be a major barrier. Finding a doctor uh, that's capable of understanding the illness and willing to help with the required documentation, as you can see in this quote, is critical. The challenge in, in, uh, in finding uh, physicians who are willing to do that um, leads to the result that most people with MCFS do not really apply for disability or that they have their applications uh, rejected. Next slide, please. So we covered many of the challenges that individuals experience, yet the challenges are not really personal in the sense that uh, many of them arise uh, from structural barriers. So I wanted you to, in the next slide, I wanted uh, to take you through a, uh, a particular story. Um, this is Jane's story uh, that helps us to, uh, to understand uh, what, a, uh, what a common uh, story uh, is really all about. And of course, uh, while this uh, story is common, there really isn't a typical um, MECFS patient. People with uh, MECFS are a very heterogeneous group. In this case, uh, Jane is struggling to recover after a case of mono, uh, the Epstein-Barr uh, virus infection. Um, her uh, healthcare provider tells her to exercise and push herself. Jane gets worse. She seeks care. She's bounced from a doctor to, to a doctor. Jane is told to seek counseling, although mental health symptoms were only secondary to, uh, to, her, uh, to her condition. She remains sick. Uh, counseling doesn't really uh, help, and her employer is now threatening to fire her. Jane remains undiagnosed, and her, and her provider will not provide the documentation for disability. And so the structural barriers here really include the, uh, the poor medical education, the topic that we uh, that were discussing today, which is compounded by MECFS having no clear home in the medical specialty uh, or otherwise, leaving most people undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. It's important to note that mental health professionals are not equipped to support people with MECFS. Uh, for instance, uh, there really is no psychiatry CME for MECFS. There is no workplace education about managing MECFS, um, and therefore there are no accommodations that are given without a diagnosis um, or doctor's orders. As a result, most people with MECFS do not apply for disability. And as I said, in many cases, uh, those applications are rejected. Next slide, please. So Jane's story continues. Uh, she finds information online. Uh, she recognizes herself that the symptoms um, uh, suggest MECFS. She returns to her doctors uh, with online information, but she's told that MECFS is not a real disease. Jane tries to find an MECFS specialist. She gets on a waiting list despite the cost barriers. Um, and the providers there ask for telemedicine uh, consult with her current medical team. Jane remains undiagnosed for now six, uh, nearly six years, and she's uh, most likely disabled for life. So I'd like to highlight one specific barrier that, that is getting very uh, more important now, 
than ever before, which is access to telehealth or telemedicine. While the use of, uh, of telehealth uh, has increased significantly during COVID, uh, we're facing coverage cuts now uh, by insurance. And uh, in addition to all the legal complications from telehealth across state, li state lines, and of course, prescribing over state lines. This is a barrier that can be and should be addressed. The delays that these structural barriers create are critical uh, because interventions in the, in the early stages of the disease in the first two years specifically improve long-term health outcomes. The recovery rate in later years um, is much lower. And of course, this is particularly important as we think about the, the implications to, to long COVID. Next slide, please. So as Jane uh, reach, reaches a, at the advanced stages of her disease, she's now disabled and homebound. It is important to point out that MECFS is not recognized a recognized condition for most uh, service providers. Therefore, home care services are usually not covered. And as we said before, there are no federally funded clinical trials uh, nor FDA approved treatment, leaving Jane uh, with little to look for. Next slide, please. When we consider all the challenges and the barriers that we discuss, it's important to recognize uh, the additional barriers uh, that come with being, for instance, a person of color. Healthcare inequities create even bigger barriers. We know that children, uh, people who are severely affected by the disease um, or that are in un um, underserved communities are all facing even more extreme challenges. Uh, I also wanted to note that uh, although veterans are more likely to have uh, MECFS, uh, the, uh, the, the VA website, for instance, still contains harmful language describing uh, MECFS as, uh, as medically unexplained and likely to be a psychological disorder. Research suggests that the prevalence um, of MECFS is, uh, is higher in these communities than what you, uh, you may see in an MECFS specialty clinic or frankly, even uh, in the representation in our own organizations. So that is something that we all must work uh, to, uh, to address. Next slide, please, thank you. Um, so in, discussion, in discussions prior to, uh, to this meeting, um, we we're thinking of what could really be uh, the vision? What would we like to see? After painting this challenging picture, what can we do? So our vision is to transition our existing structures, such as uh, at this uh, working group, into agents of change. We see the, ne the need to have in place an MECFS and long COVID interagency inter structure that has resources and accountability that can guide and implement um, the investment in solutions that is commensurate with the uh, seriousness of the problem. Specifically, uh, this, would, uh, uh, this would address the structural challenges that uh, we are talking about today. It would lead, plan, and, and execute, not just provide an advisory role. We feel that there is a need for a comprehensive five-year strategic plan, specific, target, uh, targeted goals, and, uh, and of course, to, uh, to foster the interagency collaboration and coordination. Next slide, please. From our perspective, uh, there are some inspiring examples that we could see of what can be achieved when a coordinated effort is applied. Uh, one such example that we wanted to, uh, to highlight um, uh, is the uh, Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee. Uh, this, uh, this is a federally advisory committee uh, that coordinates all government efforts. It provides advice to the Secretary of Health and Human Services related to autism. It includes both federal and public members and helps to ensure that a wide range of ideas and perspectives are represented and discussed in a public forum. And perhaps uh, important to know that it has uh, paid staff for, uh, for its support. Uh, another uh, example is uh, the Ryan White Act, which uh, is also an example of what can be achieved uh, when the right resources are committed in a coordinated way, uh, even in facing such a big challenge as uh, HIV AIDS. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, next slide, please. 
So for the people uh, from uh, the various agencies uh, in the audience today, uh, you can ensure that uh, MUCFS patients are part of your agencies and program success. We really appreciate that. Together, we can face this crisis. People with MECFS need to have full and direct participation in the policies that affect their lives. And uh, we feel uh, that the interagency working group uh, meeting, such as the one that we're having today, are, are a key and important first step. But ultimately, they must lead to a coordinated, comprehensive effort and permanent community seats at the table where policy decisions are made. Next slide, please. So um, in summary, we believe that there is a need to create a community and agency structure with a mandate to make a, a comprehensive plan with defined milestones and resource commitments, designate a uh, person that is accountable to coordinate uh, all the HHS uh, uh, response, to proactively engage the community and other key, sta uh, key stakeholders, for instance, medical societies, create a clear funding recommendations to accomplish uh, the cross-agency plan that matches the disease burden and the scientific opportunity that we see. There's a need to create uh, the research and drug development through private part, uh, uh, public private partnerships that are needed to expedite uh, the progress. And the topic of today's discussion, build the capacity and improve access to clinical service for all MCFS patients, regardless of geography, um, or income. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, um, Dr. Unger, I don't know if you'd like me to uh, to leave this slide with some uh, questions for discussions, but the, here are some uh, uh, questions that we would like to propose uh, for the uh, for the discussion um, today. Um, uh, okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, really very. Uh, comprehensive presentation. I appreciate the, the work and the thought uh, that went into that. Um, I think those questions, I mean, you, you've documented the problem and you've made some suggestions uh, uh, about what, uh, how to approach it. And so I think some of those questions that you have, uh, uh, Monica, perhaps you could save that slide and we could uh, use it at the end when we get to the overall discussion. Um, because we're still at the point of trying to flesh out uh, the problem. Um, and uh, I think you have done, you, you've covered really a, 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 lot of the, a, a lot of the area. Um, are there other comments that people want to make about, particularly from the patient perspective? And we do, um, we should probably get on to um, the Clinician Coalition presentation in approximately two. So we do have some we do have some time if anybody has any comments or questions. I really appreciate that, uh, that the organizations all work together on this and uh, that's really, yes, so, so Monica, that slide, when we get to the end of the day, um, we'll have discussion and suggestions and um, that, that will be helpful to, uh, help us organize our thoughts. Yeah, some of them. I think there'll be a, a lot of questions and suggestions, I hope, as we, as we go along. But these are excellent to keep in mind. Um, yes, Ben. Dr. Unger. Yes. Yeah, I just, uh, I just thought I'd offer one comment and anecdote for the new members here. I mean, I, I assume a lot of this content is familiar to many of the members who've been working on NMECFS and understand the depth and the gravity of this issue. Um, and we do, um, um, as our organizations came together, you know, it is um, very challenging just looking at the depth of the problem, how interrelated it is, mm -hmm. and uh, really what patients are facing. Um, myself as a patient and, and the many people I speak with, um, that and I just want to remind those um, who may be newer to the community or newer to some of these discussions. Um, you know, uh, Ovid's um, presentation of the Jane story takes you through a very um, uh, kind of common um, description, and of course there are um, many very um, other experiences that people are having. And just one recent one that happened: um, we had a person with a severe ME 
um, who's part of the kind of 25% severe to very severe group who um, had um, was losing weight, was not able to um, keep on their weight, and they um, they had to check themselves into a hospital um, because they did not because uh, uh, they they were uh, in danger of not being able to maintain their weight. Um, they went in, they saw doctors. The doctors ran like the normal gastro tests. MRIs and other things, they couldn't find anything wrong, quote unquote, wrong from their typical tests. And so that immediately led them to conclude that uh, it must be a psychological issue. And so they actually implemented a, psych, a, a psychiatric hold on this person with severe ME who went in for, for basic care. And, um, and we had, and it was really, um, um, you know, it was challenging because um, all, I've seen all the advocacy organizations, like practically everyone I know and many people on this call, like reached out to try to contact the hospital to communicate um, standards and care for people with severe ME to understand these issues and to communicate to them that a psychiatric hold was totally inappropriate and actually harmed this person with ME. Um, people with severe ME have light and sound sensitivities and um, psychiatric um, uh, uh, institute places are, are not equipped to deal with um, the complex needs of people with care. And so I just really want to emphasize that uh, it, it affects all, all people with ME differently, um, but really they're very, very vulnerable people um, who these structural things cascade upon and that, um, and, and, have, and have damage. So, you know, that, that issue was only resolved, um, not through outreach, through, through a legal fight um, and so that is that is the extent of which um, there are people with severe ME who are, you know, raising funds for medical and legal f um, on the internet on GoFundMe accounts um, to try to care for themselves. So just to give, offer that anecdote that when we're talking about some of these things, there are, all of us are at risk and, and facing challenges, some more than others, and um, and people's lives are on the, the line. Um, and I thank you, this group, for coming together. Um, I, these are two very important days to see how we can move the, um, the conversation forward. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. It is um, uh, really important that we um, work together and keep, keep, uh, keep moving this along. So I would um, now like to, I guess, shift to the clinical viewpoint and what the clinicians faced. And um, Dr. Or Mary Dimick has organized uh, the, the Clinician Coalition, and um, she volunteered uh, to do a survey of these members, and she's going to explain a little bit to us about the Clinician Coalition, and to get their perspective on um, what barriers they face in caring for patients, because as was pointed out the, many, many times, these are systematic uh, barriers. And, um, and we've invited uh, Dr. Nancy Klimas from uh, North uh, Nova Southeastern uh, University. Um, and she is a member of the Clinician Coalition, but we invited her specifically to comment on the challenges that uh, academic clinicians face in establishing an MECFS clinic. And so, Mary, if you could uh, talk to us about the Clinician Coalition survey. Thank you, Dr. Unger. First off, thank you to the organiz organizers of this meeting for the opportunity to present today. My name is Mary Dimmick, and I'll be presenting, as Beth said, the results of a survey of the U.S. MECFS Clinician Coalition about their experiences in providing care for people with MECFS and also in, in engaging the medical community in that care. The views reported in the survey will also echo, echo what we just heard from Ovid. Uh, I partnered with Cindy Bateman uh, starting in 2018 to organize the Clinician Coalition. The coalition has 21 members who have collectively spent hundreds of years treating many thousands of patients with MECFS. They are a mix of internists and a few different subspecialties. Less than half have clinics and academic centers. Their clinics are in independent um, practices. Three are already retired and a number are approaching retirement age. That's an important fact to keep in mind as you think about what needs to be done to address the clinical care for MECFS. The Clinician, clinician Coalition's goals are to document their best practices to educate the medical community and to provide clinical insight to research. 
to advance Excuse the clinical. I'm Excuse sorry? me, Mary. Are you yeah. are you re remembering to tell them to advance the slides? Yes, I am. Okay, all right. I'm just going to give them some background here. All right. <laughs> to advance the clinical care goals, the coalition has developed consensus statements and recommendations, deployed a website for medical providers, and prepared a manuscript for publication on diagnosis and management. Coalition members are also involved in research, as clinical partners of many of the research studies being done here and have also undertaken a number of educational efforts that will be discussed later. Next slide, please. Not surprisingly, the survey results underscore what we already know. We have a problem with access to clinical care for people with ME-CFS that can't be fixed without your leadership and that of key medical associations and institutions. Next slide, please. As highlighted earlier, there are an estimated 1 to 2.5 million Americans with ME-CFS, of whom an estimated 75% can't work, and 25% are homebound or bedbound. And as you all know, this is a chronic disease that can last a lifetime. And now, as a result of COVID, as, COVID, as Ovid said, the prevalence of ME-CFS could grow dramatically. In a recent publication, Drs. Anthony Komaroff and Lucinda Bateman noted the numbers of ME-CFS patients could double in just over a year as a result of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. For that one, I'm sorry, back one slide. For that one to 2.5 million people, there are an estimated 15 or less ME-CFS clinics and less than 20 clinicians in active ME-CFS-focused clinical practices across the country. This includes just one clinic for pediatrics. The survey didn't ask about patient dem demographics, but we know from a publication of the CDC multi-site study of seven of these clinics that the patients seen are overwhelmingly white, even though ME-CFS affects all races. The survey also didn't ask how many patients each clinician sees, but one clinician reported 1,000 active patients and another reported 2,000. If that represents what the others are seeing, it's still a very small percentage of the total ME-CFS pop patient population. Finally, it's important to note that 25% of the patients who are homebound, that 25% of patients who are homebound or bedbound are probably not getting to see these clinics because they can't travel and they're likely also struggling to get local care as well. Next slide, please. Now to the survey itself, 14 of the 21 coalition members responded to the following questions. Are their patients self-referred or clinician referred? Do the clinics accept insurance? And if not, why not? What challenges are experienced in engaging other clinicians in the care of their patients? or in attracting uh, other clinicians to join their practices? And what are the barriers to increasing the number of knowledgeable, willing clinicians? What have these clinicians done to educate the medical community and what impact has that had? And finally, what needs to be done to increase the number of willing, knowledgeable providers to address the access issue that was so clearly called out in the chart that Ovid presented? I'll go through each of these responses to the questions next. Next slide, please. Starting with referral, 50% of the clinicians said that the patients were self-referred, 20% said the patients were clinician referred, and 30% said that there was a combination of the two. The survey did not ask why, why this might be, but some of the responses to later questions might suggest that the lack of recognition of MBCFS and these clinics by the medical community was, would play a role in that. Next slide, please. Thank you. The next questions were on insurance reimbursement. As, we, as was pointed out earlier, ME-CFS is, ME is a complex disease that requires significant time to diagnose and manage. Clinicians reported taking two and sometimes as long as three hours for an initial appointment and follow-up appointments can also be long. They also spend additional time reviewing medical records, which can be extensive. Supporting disability requests, which was as noted earlier, can be challenging. Filing insurance appeals to get coverage and addressing support needs, which especially for the severely ill could be significant. 
The amount of time clinicians spend on visits in these other activities is not reimbursed by insurance. A few doctors noted that the low reimbursement rate is especially problematic for the internists in the group. As a result, 50% of the respondents said they do not accept insurance. 21% said they only accept Medicare or Medicare plus one other insurance. 21% do accept insurance and 8% accept insurance, but also use a concierge model on a sliding scale to help offset the lack of fund uh, reimbursement from insurance. Lack of, lack of reimbursement and reimbursement issues doesn't just affect clinician time, it also affects their ability to provide the necessary office procedures, tests, and treatments. Some clinicians said they could get tests covered, but much more commonly, they reported challenges with getting coverage for both tests and treatment, and even in some cases for basic or common ones, such as those for office data intolerance often seen in MECFS. One clinician noted that the insurance may require that they first prescribe a series of other treatments before being finally allowed to provide the treatment they knew was needed to begin with. Another clinician noted that the treatments are used off-label um, because of the lack of published evidence and research, and that that makes it easy for insurance companies to deny coverage. They also said this can affect needed tests. One clinician described the resultant daily nightmare of pre-authorizations, then peer-to-peer -peer reviews, and finally appeals that could take hours and hours and extend over weeks to months. One clinician noted that the appeals are typically successful, but to get there, he had invested a significant amount of time and the patient had often been left waiting for months. While it doesn't fix the problem, uh, clinicians have reported that it can help to improve coverage by documenting and coding any comorbidities such as POTS, mast cell activation syndrome, et cetera, because these may have better um, coverage than what MECFS does. Now, the, it's, uh, some of these issues affect other people within the clinical, you know, other clinicians outside of MECFS. They're not unusual, but I would say the magnitude of the issues are particularly severe with MECFS because of the re reasons mentioned here and also discussed further below. <clears throat> and a lot, this lack of, re as a result, this lack of reimbursement will impede MECFS clinical care by any provider, not just these experts. Can you go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> Excuse me. The next, the next questions were about the challenges these clinicians experience in engaging the medical community, either in the care of their patients or to come work at their clinics. Patients may not always have a PCP, but when they do, a few respondents said these PCPs could be quite engaged. But more commonly, respondents reported that PCPs were rarely engaged. Excuse me just a minute. A variety of reasons for this were noted, including, as was noted by Ovid in his presentation, the PCPs could be dismissive, don't believe in the disease, or think it's psychosomatic. They don't understand MECFS or its treatment and had no exposure in medical school to the disease. They view it as too complex and too difficult to manage. And, and really importantly there, and we'll come back to this, they're uncomfortable practicing outside of the evidence base and standard medical practice, and they're put off by the lack of diagnostics and FDA-approved treatments. Finally, they don't have the time in their practices and or they can be penalized by their health plans for spending too much time with patients or thinking outside the box. Some clinicians suggested it's easier to engage specialists than PCPs, but others felt it was just as difficult. A few did note that the situation with the pandemic may be starting to improve, sadly, may be starting to improve um, this situation because more attention is being brought to it. The survey also asked about additional challenges with getting clinicians to join their MECFS practice. As noted before, the number of clinicians is very slow, or very small, and a number of them are approaching retirement, and we really need to expand the number of clinicians in the field. But the additional challenges that they noted was the view that the practices could be considered too narrow and too off track for a normal clinician career. 
that MECFS in the slide says the patients, but this should really be MECFS is too complex and demanding to manage. And that it's difficult to provide a competitive salary for the new clinician to the practice without increasing rates. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The next survey asked about the barriers that would need to be addressed to in, in order to increase the number of PCPs and specialists willing and able to treat patients, people with MECFS. It also asked about the barriers to increasing the number of MECFS experts, since the pool of experts is small. These questions, these answers are gonna overlap somewhat with what was done, was said previously. Um, the responses for increasing the number of people, physicians willing to treat and increasing the number of experts overlapped and so are grouped into four themes. The top five responses are bolded. The first theme involves the stigma towards MECFS, the lack of knowledge about the disease and how to treat it, and its perceived complexity, as was discussed earlier. Respondents added that many clinicians perceive there is little that they can do to help with MECFS and or they do not want to manage chronic illnesses. The second theme also previously discussed is the lack of reimbursement. That'll come up a number of times throughout this presentation. And for the, um, both for clinician time and for the tests, treatments and support services required to care for these patients. The third theme is the lack of research, especially the lack of formal clinical trials and evidence for treatments. This is critical to address in workforce planning when you consider that the respondent's comments about clinicians being uncomfortable practicing outside of the evidence base and being put off by the lack of diagnostics and FDA approved treatments. This lack of evidence makes it difficult to engage them in the care of MECFS patients. In addition to the lack of research, some respondents also noted that the slow pace of research can also impact the perception of the field. And the fourth theme is the lack of support from medical institutions and peers for clinicians caring for people with MECFS and the lack of support services to help people. Some of this is direct, you know, peer to peer, doctor to doctor, whether the other doctor that you're trying to work with actually respects the work that you do. And this challenge, this issue is also challenging for those who are homebound, bed bound, and especially for those needing total care. Next slide, please. <coughs> the next question asked about the approaches these clinicians have used to educate the medical community. And they've taken a variety and do take a variety of different approaches um, across the board. A number of the respondents reported providing on-site learning opportunities such as rotations for pre-medical students, medical students and practicing physicians. One respondent whose clinic is at an academic center reported providing up to 24 rotations a year for first through fourth year students across both their clinic and their research program. But more typically, respondents reported providing a few rotations a year at most. Sometimes they were for pre-med students, but more usually for practicing physicians who would visit for a brief period of time, a couple of days, I think was the most common answer. One respondent noted that that those going through the rotations typically did not go on to focus in MECFS, but at least they were more aware. While these rotations were seen as valuable, a few, a few respondents noted that many physicians are not interested and or can't take the time away from their own practices. And another respondent said that providing these rotations slows efficiency in an already financially strapped system at their clinic. A number of respondents called out the need for funding to support these kinds of more intensive learning opportunities if we wanna move forward. The clinicians also said that they provide a variety of informational material for providers such as primers, handouts, articles, links, and websites, especially websites and online educational material that they've produced at their own clinics. But some said that the physicians aren't interested and that they suspect the materials are much more often used by patients than by providers. Finally, the respondents said they have also done CMEs presented at con conferences, provided telementoring and medical consults on specific cases, all of which help increase the knowledge of other clinicians. One respondent noted that listservs have been particularly helpful because it provides a case-based forum for discussing and learning about particular cases. 
The clinicians have also authored documents for publication in the medical literature, but it's worth noting that getting an ME article published can be its own challenge, particularly given the lack of research, supporting published information, and even the misperception about the disease. All these methods have their place and were seen as being effective, at least when the clinicians are interested. But even if all the clinicians were interested, this is just a handful of doctors and we're only talking about, we're only talking about a small handful of doctors and they can barely touch the magnitude of the need that we have. Next slide, please. The final survey question asked what needs to be done to increase the number of doctors willing and able to care for people with MECFS. First, respondent, first, the respondents noted the need to refute the significant information about the nature and treatment of MECFS and to provide a range of educational opportunities to build basic knowledge and provide the kinds of advanced learning gained through telementoring and on-site rotations. <coughs> Excuse me. One clinician noted that refuting the information must address the persistent belief that the disease is psychosomatic and can be treated by cognitive behavioral therapy. Addressing this kind of refuting the misinformation and also providing the learning opportunities that are needed is going to require a comprehensive plan and substantial funding, including specific funding to support those richer online, those richer learning opportunities, such as rotations and telemetry. It's also going to require strong leadership and commitment from federal agencies and importantly from medical associations. One respondent noted that while there are clinical guides, many clinical guides from ECFS, none have been accepted by the American, um, I'm sorry, American College of Physicians. That's probably true for other key medical associations as well. How far will any educational program get if these associations are not involved? Second, reimbursement, reimbursement. We've talked about it many times. That system needs to be fixed. It needs to reimburse care based on the time and complexity of MECFS and to co cover medically appropriate tests, medications, and support services. This includes the addressing the issues with telehealth insurance for cross-site healthcare and also support services that Ovid mentioned earlier. Federal agencies, insurance companies, and the health care health provider plans will need to be involved to make this happen. Third and related is getting the health institutes, the academic centers and the health plans to provide incentives, not punishment for those providing care for con con I'm sorry, chronic complex diseases. One respondent noted a gastroenterologist was so pressured by her academic center to see fewer complex patients and do more procedures that she left medicine and went into research. Such incentives must also cover care for the severely ill. Fourth is the need for diagnostics and for FDA treatment, approved treatments, or at least published evidence for the treatments already being used off label. Uh, this group of clinicians has called for clinical trials for a number of the medications that they're used, be, already using off label. Research and research fin funding must become a more substantial pr priority. And finally, a team-based approach is required to provide the care needed for MECFS patients. In addition to PCPs, this must include the key subspecialties plus physical therapists, occupational therapists, case managers, support services, etc. This could be achieved with clinical care centers that co-locate these disciplines and provide ongoing care over the course of the patient's illness, not just for six months. But at the very least, this will require outreach and active participation to these critical disciplines. <clears throat> Next slide, please. It's impossible to over overestimate the significant issues that exist in provisioning clinical care for people with MECFS. This obviously has had a significant impact on patients across the country and will impact any long COVID patients who go on to develop MECFS. But it's also important to note that it's had a significant impact on the clinicians who are trying to provide care for these patients. One clinician noted that the current situation with MECFS is creating burnout in the very limited supply of these clinicians. And he noted that the flood of post-COVID patients will and is already making that situation magnitudes worse. Given the likelihood that the pandemic could significantly increase the number of MECFS patients, 
and that the pool of MECFS clinicians is small and often older. This is an urgent crisis that must be addressed quickly. We need your leadership, that of key medical societies, medical institutions, academic centers, and health plans to fix this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beth. Dr. Unger. Oh, thank you, Mary. And um, thank you for, for your leadership in, uh, you are very key in organizing the Clinician Coalition, which I think is in a very effective group for uh, advancing this field. And I think the, the comments about so few of the MECFS clinicians being academically based is uh, very important because it's the academics that really lead the research and academics, uh, need to understand the illness in order to, to, um, to make the advances that are necessary. And that's why I thought it was important to take a moment to really specifically comment on barriers that academic, uh, academic clinicians face in having an MECFS practice. So Nancy, if you could take a few minutes to comment on that, and then we'll have a bigger discussion. Yes, and thank you. And Mary, that was really a very nice discussion from the clinician's perspective about what we're seeing. I want to um, tell folks who don't know, remember this or don't know this, that there was a paper by Lenny Jason some years ago um, that said basically the clinicians that were most likely to know what to do or at least recognize the illness when it walked through their door were the clinicians that had the illness in their families. That meant we had failed to teach them we weren't teaching it in medical school. We weren't teaching it in residency. We're not teaching it in post-residency um, CMEs. And at that time, and it's not changed very much since, only 15% of the MECFS cases in the country had received the diagnosis. Meaning that 85% of the time, if you walk through a doctor's door, the doctor wasn't knowledgeable enough to recognize the illness and at least diagnose it, if not treat it. So I think we're in that situation still today. It's not very different. But um, we put this uh, pandemic overlay on top of what was a, a weak system to begin with. The HHS has an advisory committee for MECFS or had for many, many years. And many, many years, year after year, the, one of the number one recommendations was to create centers of excellence, clinical and research centers of excellence so that there could be epicenters of educational as well as research and clinical care, much as we did with the cancer centers early in that space and that type of thing. So, um, and that um, hasn't found a path yet. So let me tell you about our academic, ex our experience. We're an MECFS clinic, um, focus clinic at Nova Southeastern University with the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine. And we assembled about 18 faculty members and another 40 or so lab techs and other support people to do a combination of research and clinical care in a space that was trying to do the three pillars, education, research, and care. And the three pillars that, we, that need to be done. I know um, we're pleased that we've managed to assemble and do much of that. But before COVID happened, if you backtracked one year ago, we had 400 patients on our wait list and it was taking two to three years to get an, uh, an appointment in our expert clinic. That's shocking. We have, I think, six practitioners. It's probably one of the bigger clinics in the country that's focused on this. And um, so we're kind of, you know, six is not nearly enough to take care of. I think we have about 3,500 patients in our, in our care. So um, that's where we were before COVID. Recognizing in our research experience that there's a narrow window to intervene before something that is just a lingering chronic illness turns into a lifelong miserable illness. And that that window is probably right now for the post-COVID people, that the, an intervention should be happening now and not after we've studied it for four or five years. Mm -hmm. um, we have to think about things a little differently right now and be very responsive uh, to um, the needs of, of the patient population, even in the absence of evidence-based guidelines. We know a lot about MECFS and we know a lot about its care, partly from the seat of our pants, the coalition, the clinician coalition has, shares a lot of common experience and knowledge and part through 
what little evidence-based medicine clinical trials there have been. Uh, and I will emphasize the word little because well, I study an, another illness called Gulf War illness where the um, funding mechanisms for clinical trials are aggressively put forward, particularly in the CDRMP program where advocates are extremely involved in the priorities year by year and then in the calls for proposals every single year change in response to new knowledge of the prior year. And, and then we don't really do that in, in our other funding agencies very much, but I will say the CDRMP, <laughs> if you looked at Gulf War illness, you'd find 23 active clinical trials and you wouldn't find that from the other um, spaces where funding might be happening. Not that the trials aren't happening, but not 23. I mean, it's just hasn't happened. And the CDRMP funded a clinical trials network grant um, to fast forward translation and phase one, two stuff out there. So as a clinician, who's also an investigator, I'm going to say, I feel a little tied because we are supposed to be doing evidence-based medicine as much as we can, even in MECFS, despite 30 years in my career, 35 years of work, where certainly we understand the underlying underpinnings and even have targetable points. Um, we haven't had the kind of funding needed to evidence base the guidelines that would um, allow us to do that kind of work so, enter so, a pandemic and post COVID care. Is, so this is what we're doing. Is the, but um, what could you, yeah, I think there's lots of needs and we, we, we're going to be talking about the, the COVID, particularly the long COVID and the relationship uh, to a little bit more tomorrow, but, but for today, what were the unique challenges? I mean, why aren't there more academic clinicians um, So our unique challenge yeah. at our site, which is probably one of the better sites that should be able to be responsive to something we have, a, you know, the expertise, was to have to make the hard decision whether the 400 people on that wait list have been waiting for years needed to wait longer so that we could get these post-COVID people in as fast as we could and hope to intervene early in their course. Big ethical dilemma. I mean, you can't believe how much time we spent discussing that in our group. Nonetheless, we're trying to find ways to get people in and we realize it's completely inadequate. So this is what we're doing to try to reframe. We're creating our post-COVID care clinic at our, our university. We're gonna do a much better job with smoke and mirrors and no funding. <laughs> we just hope to be able to do this, but, um, to take our clinical group that is the MECFS um, expert group and use it as an, a tiered approach. So we're gonna use the primary care network that is at our university, internal medicine, family medicine, and the nurse practitioner primary care clinics that are across the state. And we're gonna be their backbone. We're gonna teach them what to do. We're gonna do case management conferences every week, bring cases in and, and and support the primary care network in being better at this. For this, we think they're finally pushing out knowledge that is useful to the primary care uh, providers who, see, who, who want to do. I mean, don't think that most doctors want to push you out of their office. <laughs> they don't know what to do when they see you. And that feels bad when you're a doctor and you're looking at somebody going, oh man, this person's sick, but what do I do? And then not have any place to refer them to that makes any sense. So instead, we're going to try to give them the tools they need to, to do the initial evaluations and, and do that kind of thing, but back them up um, with the expertise of our group. So that's our plan. It would work a whole lot better if there was a funding mechanism because, you know, basically there's no new people or money to do anything with. So we're trying to ask people to to make space in their clinics, their already busy clinics for more patients and for us to make space and time in our practices right. be more supportive. But that's what we're gonna do. And then we're gonna pursue money. We hope to someday find some support to, to push this out. So uh, <laughs> trying to reframe it in general from an academic clinician uh, point of view, did you have trouble getting your administration to allow you the extra time that was needed? I mean, is it a, is it a structural Absolutely. barrier like that, or is it a lack of understanding of the uh, of your uh, departments? Um, you know, whatever department you're in, internal medicine or infectious diseases of the illness. I mean, I'm just trying to understand well, I mean, actually, why there aren't more academic uh, physicians. That was my old problem, the one that I left the well, university for. <laughs> to that, go to the university that 
got it. So yeah, I'm so, an so, osteopathic medical school. I left an allopathic school where I was not functioning well. I wasn't providing the needs to the patients. And I went to an osteopathic medical school, Nova Southeastern, which has been very welcoming and gets this total body integrative complex medicine thing. It fits into the way they teach. Mm -hmm. So um, I've been very happy being uh, an MD in a DO school. Um, I don't fit personally, but my mm -hmm. field works better. Mm -hmm. And we housed our whole practice in the integrative medicine, functional medicine space, which works great for uh, MECFS. That's the place to house this. Yeah. So just, uh, not to try to force fit the square peg and round hole all the time. This works really well in an integrative medicine space. And then that using specialty care as needed, if you need ID or whatever to, to assist, then you, you can do that. So that was one thing is trying to find a home institution that wanted us. <laughs> and we did, we found that. Mm -hmm. And it's been a very supportive and nurturing environment for us. The other was to understand that to make the advances in research that this field needs, we had to wrap our research program around the clinical care program. And that is lacking everywhere. If you want to ask why we don't have trials, well, mm -hmm. who's going to do the trials? You know, the clinical, the clinical uh, care program in an academic center can serve as the translational medicine unit, the thing that moves things from phase one and phase two and out into the bigger, bigger things. And mm -hmm. so having um, uh, clinics that are, that are affiliated with or actually wrapped around and, and, and a part of a broader research program, that's a really good uh, strategy. And that's the strategy we have used. So for post-COVID care, well, let's, really let's, let's stay up because we need the patients to do the research. <laughs> do you understand that we need to have the capacity mm -hmm. to see these patients right. so that we can be effective investigators? And I'm telling you that we were full up to above our ears before the, the epidemic. Right. And so now we're trying to find the space and the, we want to be expert, you know, we need mm -hmm. clinical experience. I saw two post-COVID patients this morning, yes. but, the, <laughs> but you know, you need to smoke and mirrors, man. You just got to make it happen with, with nothing. Okay. Um, we have a hand, uh, Dr. Catherine Argue from Department of Defense. You wanted to make a comment? I just wanted to quickly respond because Dr. Kilmes brought up the funding that we have at CDMRP for Gulf War illness. And I just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that everyone in the audience is aware that we do now have funding specifically for MECFS. It is not its own program. It falls under the umbrella program of the peer-reviewed medical research program, but we specifically have MECFS as a topic area under that program, which allows us to do funding for this very similar to what we had done for um, Gulf War illness, where we can fund clinical trials, large coalition type research, et cetera. So if we need to do a better job of making sure that clinicians and researchers are aware of that funding opportunity, please let me know. Okay. Thank you. That was super helpful because I think what I like about the CDRMP is the role of the advocate in helping set the priorities of the program year by year, every single year. Mm -hmm. There's new the ability to, to shift the focus or, or move things that need to go from bench to clinic forward. And that's been really rewarding. And it has made a big difference in a very similar illness. And Mary Dimmick, you have your hand, another comment? Mary, you're muted. Just adding to the questions that you were asking, Beth, one of the things that was called out at the FDA meeting in 2012 for MECFS was by the industry rep from Eli Lilly. And she noted that it's really impossible for pharma virtually to get involved if we don't have academic centers who are actually studying, treating and studying this disease. Mm -hmm. And then additionally, um, from what I understand of the DOD and Nancy, your work, they've set up some work to be able to build the clinical trials infrastructure that would be needed to be able to advance these clinical trials. And we don't really have that in MECFS yet. And then finally, because of the lack of clinicians at all, never mind in academic institutes, it would be hard to do the level of research that we need, clinical trials research that we need to advance the disease. So there's a set of 
overlapping interrelated issues here yes. that need to be addressed. Yeah, I really feel that the shortage of academic uh, clinicians is is just really key. And that's why I really wanted to focus on what are the, the, the barriers. If the academic clinicians are there, they'll be part of the medical school. Students will rotate through clinics um, and we will solve a lot of our problems. So I, I think we need to increase the academic representation in this field and it is, uh, as Nancy points out, the, um, the uh, and we're going to talk about at more length tomorrow, the, the long COVID um, may be this opportunity to, to really spark uh, a true uh, academic interest and in, um, collaboration. Um, uh, ben, you have a comment? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Inger. And I just wanted to add on to what you said. Um, I think academic centers um, and clinicians are really important, um, and it would be um, really great to see, you know, that flow of medical students through. Um, I do want to um, also make the, the point that, you know, remind people what we're experiencing right now. And so it is also really important that how are we going to train, um, do provide mechanisms that will provide the doctors that are um, doing it now. Mm -hmm. and, and the point that Mary made earlier about we have a knowledge base of doctors who are practicing right now who are nearing retirement and that, 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 that group is shrinking. Mm -hmm. um, so there is both investing for the future and, the, and what mechanisms can we put in place um, for, um, for training doctors right now who are practicing. Yes, it is. Um, we, CDC had a study with seven different clinics and two of those clinics have, have closed uh, due to retirement already. Um, and a third is, is threatening. So um, we have, uh, we're very, very aware of the, 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 the aging out um, phenomenon and we really need to keep, uh, to build the, build the expertise. Um, uh, I, I got a message from uh, people watching the question and answer. Christine, did you have some questions you wanted to share? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Christine Pearson. I manage communications for the part of CDC that the MECFS program falls under. Um, so we've gotten quite a number of, of questions. Um, what we decided, since we're running a little ahead right now, we'll take some of them now, um, and then we'll, we'll save the rest for the end of the day. Um, I did want to mention that there we've gotten some that are on lo long COVID, and since those are that's going to be our my, main topic for tomorrow, um, we're taking those down, and we will save those for tomorrow um, to intersperse with the conversation about long COVID. Then, um, so the first one that we have, um, and this is a little long, is from Lily Chu. And it says, fields like primary care medicine, child psychiatry, and geriatric medicine also have workforce shortages. Many of these issues discussed today are similar to those faced by these fields. Primary among them is reimbursement. Cognitively oriented fields are paid less per minute per visit than procedurally oriented fields like surgery. Has anyone contacted the players in these fields about their initiatives? Also, how much of a role can CDC really play in terms of increasing the workforce? Unlike other countries, we don't have a national healthcare system that addresses appropriate workforce balance. Well, thank you. That's... Can I make a comment on that? There's one thing that federal agencies can do, which is get MECFS in this post-COVID illness on the list of co complex illnesses that are reimbursed at a higher rate by Medicare, because Medicare sets the standard. And that allows you to spend more time per patient. Right now, things like diabetes and congestive heart failure are on the list, but you have to be on the list to get that extra reimbursement. And it gives you a chance to be spend more time per patient. So that is one thing. Okay. And then, Lily, I don't think we're going to solve the problem of not enough doctors, but we want to entice some over. And in academic medicine, research funding is very enticing if it can go to physician scientists as well as to bench scientists. So mm -hmm. the idea that there's clinical science opportunities and it's not restricted entirely to, to bench scientists. And I would make a huge play for a clinical trials network. And the other uh, play is not 
forget that MECFS and post-COVID illness are, are comparator illnesses, and it's straightforward to include MECFS in the grants that we write mm -hmm. as the comparator illness. And so new work can be done on the back of the new post-COVID monies that will be coming into the research field. Um, uh, this is this is Dr. Selinger. Can you all hear me? Yes. I want to make sure you all know that as of 1-1-2021, just eight weeks ago, CMMS um, launched the biggest change to reimbursement in primary care and evaluation and management codes since 1997. They have streamlined the documentation process. No longer does one have to worry about documenting elements of history, past family, medical, social, and physical exam. They have increased the reimbursement for time-based. They have allowed time-based codes to include face-to-face, non-face-to-face, and the review of records. And they've also increased the medical decision-making reimbursement. Again, uh, the biggest change, and although doctors are aware of it, they need to link this to the awareness that patients such as MECFS who take more time, they can now bill and there are modifiers where you can keep adding on, adding on, adding on time-based billing that is expected to make a significant difference in the reimbursement for primary care. Oh, well, thank you for pointing that out. And um, did you say that was CMS that made the change? And if so, that Dr. Is Ling? C that is CMMS, and it applies C to Medicare. CMMS, okay. Right? Yeah. It is. This is Sherry Ling from CMS. Yes. And uh, uh, Dr. Howard is correct. It is Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, but we go by CMS and drop one of the M's. I do not know why. Um, <laughs> but um, I think that was, was well said. I think... Um, you know, uh, there's been a lot of work that has been done uh, really to better support the care that is needed that's delivered to um, Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, I will also say that I think what you are referring to is some of the complex billing codes, um, the modifiers, if you will. Now, those are, I would venture to guess that they would be applicable here, um, such as the chronic care management code. Um, yes. And by definition, um, it is operationally defined as uh, to, to apply to people whose care is more complex and complex is defined as greater than one condition. So Correct. it is really intended to try to um, really provide the opportunity to, to provide the care that is needed. Um, I, I will also say that, um, and, and I understand that this is a double-edged sword, um, be, but some of the other behavioral health codes are also applicable. Um, now, we have operationalized that in very general terms as well. So behavioral health does not mean substance disorder, substance disorder or, any, you know, uh, by definition, but it also includes, um, uh, and we had to figure out how to define this as broad as broadly as we could to catch as many people as could be applied to, but, you know, it can also apply to to um, people with sleep disorders and and other types of symptoms that are hard to characterize. Yep. So I just didn't want anyone to you know take that code um, the way it's not intended to put a label on someone. But these are different ways um, to uh, enhance the amount of time acknowledge how much time it takes to provide the care that is necessary. Um, and, you know, recognizing that right. people with chronic conditions go in and out of a ver variety of settings, there are also care transitions billing codes. Um, and their intent is to try to acknowledge that your medications may change, right, from one setting to another. And 
each time you have to reconcile what is needed. Some will no longer be needed. Others new will be needed, but it all requires uh, time and attention. So um, perhaps at, uh, I can ask uh, my team to provide um, a link to some of these resources that kind of summarize these different codes. Um, I don't know if that would be helpful, but glad to do. Over. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. That's that's very helpful. I think that would that would be helpful. Um, and then this great. needs to be rolled out to physicians on the front line so they understand how these opportunities that are new or pre-existing can be applied to patients with complex chronic conditions like ME-CFS. Thank you for raising that. That's very good. So I think we have time for a couple more questions before we get to the end of what was supposed to be this section. Um, so um, the next one comes from, I'm going to probably butcher this, I'm sorry in advance, um, Katie Dabalik. Um, who says, how many institutions and clinics are doing clinical trials already? Should we begin by encouraging clinicians to consider clinical trial training as well? <laughs> Multi-center trials would also be useful for all of us around the world. Yes, um, I, we're going to talk about uh, these issues a little bit more, and uh, we have a special... Uh, Dr. Vicki Whittemore is going to talk about NIH's uh, initiative to try to increase uh, clinical trials. It, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, there are some clinical trials listed for MECFS. Um, there, at this point, I, some of them are enrolling and some of them aren't. Um, then they're usually fairly small. Um, but um, yes, that clinical trials are, are desperately uh, needed. And I see Charmian, you have a, a comment. Now yeah. I wanna go back to an earlier uh, topic. I'm sorry to change the subject. I think this is an important um, revelation actually, <laughs> but I wanted to go back to the, as long as we're still on the patient voice to yes. talk to, to the point of how we can get the healthcare providers on the ground, the vast majority of them, um, better positioned to help MECFS patients. And I, I don't think this is necessarily clinic, uh, comp complicated cl clinical and medical education. I think the point that Ovid made in the presentation that just believing the patient and supporting the patient mm -hmm. and making addressing with some common sense suggestions about how to address the most troublesome symptoms can be helpful. Mm -hmm. But in terms of believing the patient, um, there's still an enormous stigma attached to medically unexplained symptoms, I'm going to call it, which would also describe MECFS. And what I think is really needed is a very, very strong statement coming down from the top <laughs> that's going to reach the broad base of providers that MECFS is a real illness, a real physical illness and needs to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And that there are some things that every healthcare provider can do. And to go along with that, <clears throat> I think, uh, there needs to be more, there need to be more articles in a broad variety of journals that <clears throat> cover the, the journals that clinicians typically read. And in this area, one of those is the New England Journal of Medicine, mm -hmm. which has not published any article on MECFS since 1959 or something like that. And I know there may be many reasons for that, but I think that's something that everyone needs to think about getting, getting articles in the journals that clinicians tend to read. Yes, thank you. We are, at, at, after our break, we're gonna talk about the things that have been tried and, um, and uh, we will then have a bigger discussion, but these are very important points, trying to uh, be sure that there is a consistent message about the nature of this illness and um, 
and I agree with you that primary care physicians are important um, in caring for these patients and they can at least uh, do the basics. And it does start with listening and believing. And so to that point, Beth, uh, actually there was, there, was, there was one question, which I know we, we have answered in other forums before, but just in case there are other people on who've not been in, on our other calls, um, this one uh, comes from Alan Gerwitt. Um, it says, until the federal health agencies declare that MECFS is a real medical illness, there will be no progress. All the problems you've mentioned will continue as a general population and medical communities have no conviction of the reality of MECFS. Why has this public de declaration not been made in spite of the contributions of individuals and some agencies? Well, I, I will start by saying I think CDC has been very clear in, in making uh, the statement that MECFS is an important illness and is biologically based and is not associated with malingering and needs to be taken very seriously. Um, and I believe NIH has done that as well. And I'm not sure how else to make the message clearer. Um, and we are also aware that patients with MECFS uh, face stigma. And we, are, we do have the sense that even researchers and um, clinicians treating MECFS patients face stigma, lack of understanding. Um, somebody mentioned just today that it was harder, hard to get articles published about MECFS. Um, and that is the, that does face sometimes the reviewers don't understand or don't, don't, uh, don't listen to other professionals uh, either. So um, when we come to our discussion time and plans, when, if there are concrete ideas about how this could be done more systematically or more uh, directly, um, and I don't know if uh, uh, others of the, of the government wanna comment on what they've done or what their thoughts are. All right, um, so I think let's just, there's a few more that I think might have short answers maybe. Okay. Um, so, before, um, sorry, Christine. Oh, yes. I, apolog I apologize. Before we go on, at least one thing I'd like to, to know, and maybe this comes back, we deal with this at another point in terms of, um, you know, addressing the issues. I think there's also, there's a difference between, you know, a, a statement somewhere, um, um, the CDC has updated their website um, in some ways, and so those changes have been reflected. But in terms of also like, you know, when we think about people like those severe people with ME who are, you know, um, in front of hospital staff who are already uh, misbelieving them, like some clear high level communications um, that, that are put out um, would go a long way to like stopping immediate harm. So I think we need to think about like higher level communications that are clearer, I think, um, and two other points I'll just quickly make is, you know, to what extent that we do have, um, when we have pockets of knowledge um, in places, like how can we amplify and lift that up? Um, so there is a lot of good information coming out of, like I would say the MECFS Clinician Coalition, how can we get that um, publicized to more, how can our federal agency partners come together and get that information that's over within these experts out mm -hmm. to the entire community? Um, and then one third aspect I'll uh, mention is that, that I think is important as a part of this agency group, is looking at how do we get each of the agencies delivering a clear and consistent message. So for example, you know, look over on the, um, I, I was looking at a, a VA page the other day um, that, that has, that, that lists um, MECFS under war-related illness um, uh, about MECFS. And right there on the front, it says, um, treatments for some treatments for MECFS include graded exercise therapy, psychological therapies, medications. Mm -hmm. So th these are like these are clearly not um, um, what you know. Graded exercise therapy, psychological and psychological therapies are not the recommended therapies for ME MECFS. And so, how can we make sure that across agencies, like a consistent message about this disease is communicated, and we deal with unevenness in communication? So, I, I think that we do need to think about like communication strategies and how okay. we can both amplify things. 
Sure. And let me jump in then real quick on your, your, the first part of yours. Um, I do agree that, that you're right. And actually one of the things that we are working on now, and we hope to have them posted soon are some provider handouts and they're very, um, yeah, they're, they're written in a way that it's, you know, it's a, ge a general overview of what is MECFS even, and what do people need to know? Um, with the idea, and then, you know, we will be working on trying to get awareness out that those are available, um, because hopefully that will help with some of the sort of general uh, clinician populations. And uh, CDC, and can I, I, yes. I would like to just, sorry, I'll just make one other comment, is that um, in terms of communication, so I know we deal with this problem of like the evidence base from which to communicate, we want to be cl clear on our evidence base, um, but uh, in all the statements made, um, but to also think about when, when these communications go out, like we are dealing with a, um, the medical providers oftentimes he's going to are people who already have stigmatized views of the disease. So it's also, um, you know, convincing somebody, and, and I've been, been in the situation where, um, you know, people are committed to psychiatric units I've been calling on the phone, trying to convince the, the nurses to, that they can't force this person to get up to go to the phone or get up to eat, that they need to bring food to, this, um, to a person and not um, present them as malingering. Um, so I think, you know, there is, there's the perspective, there may be a perspective of the federal agencies of like, well, we've said something and it should be clear. Um, but given, I think we also need to think about communication strategy in light of um, the first presentations that, um, that Ovid gave and Mary gave of just how um, stigmatized and confused um, a lot of the, and uninformed, a lot of the community, uh, the, the medical community is, like how do we break that down? And um, there are, there's some very large barriers of stigma. And so we've got to go the, over and above um, yes. to figure out how we, how we overcome those challenges. That's one thing I'll say. Okay, thank you. Dr. Ling, did you have a, another comment or is it your hand left up from before? Oh, I finally figured out how to raise the hand, and oh. so I didn't actually take it down. Sorry. Okay. And uh, Mary, is yours up from before, or do you have something, another comment? Yeah, the only thing I would add, and we'll prob we probably will talk about this more later, is that the federal agencies, their role is really important. But when you think about how doctors, where doctors are getting their information from, they're likely getting it from their medical associations, from the institutions that they work in, et cetera. Yes. So the federal agency can do certain things to help with communication. But I think one of the biggest things they can do is use their political capital with these organizations to get mm -hmm. these organizations to be communicating to their members, yes. clear, concise information that refutes the misinformation about the disease and helps them understand how to diagnose and treat it. Thank you. Yes. And Ken, did you have an, a comment? And then we'll go for break after this. <laughs> uh, sorry, you're on mute. In my screen, if I take my uh, cursor down to the bottom, you get there's the microphone to unmute. Mm, well, maybe. Ah, yeah. oh, there you go. Am I okay? Yes. So I'm here. Okay, so I'd like, if, if possible, to have some thought given to stigma and possibly a more organized or more robust response to stigma when it is encountered. I can give you two personal examples. Uh, I and Andy Selinger recently submitted a paper on diagnosis and treatment of ME-CFS to a journal and the journal editor, even though the paper finally got through peer review, rejected it with the comment that she had personal experience with the MECFS. 
and she knows that Emmy's Ken, this is Vicki. You're breaking up. Maybe if you turn your camera off, we can hear you better. Triggered by sexual childhood abuse. Mm. Uh, oh, dear. So uh, now now we're on mute. Let, um, perhaps let's take, take our break. And Ken, we can finish your comments. Um, and maybe Monica, you and Ken can work together to see if there's something we could do to, to get this, get him a little bit clearer. Um, we, we did, I do, I do think everybody needs to stretch and uh, take, take a few moments. And we are uh, due to come back at uh, uh, 2.55. So it's gonna be a, a, a quick break. So I will comment. Okay, so what I wanted to say was that I, I would appreciate, and if one wanted to overcome stigma, perhaps this is some way that we think about some sort of more organized or a response to stigma when it is encountered in the academic workplace. My situation was that in 2010, I received an email from my chairman saying that my activities in the field of chronic fatigue syndrome, which at that time, Beth, as you know, was essentially, I did some work for the, the CDC at that time uh, or prior to that time. And I was then working with Dennis Magnan on the NIH uh, M chronic fatigue syndrome state of knowledge workshop which we held in 2011, I believe, I was told that my work, work in the field of chronic fatigue syndrome was unprofessional. And um, I could not find anyone who would stand up to that comment. And rather than give up that work, I decided I would retire rather than do that. But I don't think there are many other people who would be willing to do that. So if there was a way for some organized or stronger insistence that when such kinds of comments or such resistance, such as chronic fatigue syndrome or ME-CFS now is unprofessional or that ME-CFS is triggered by childhood abuse, if there could be some more organized uh, response or authoritative response, um, I, it, I, it might help. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, I will say we are definitely aware of the issue of stigma and uh, Vicki and I both joined um, and I, the trans agency working group on stigma to understand how stigma is being approached in other illnesses. And uh, we prepared a presentation for the stigma working group about MECFS and the kinds of stigma uh, faced. So that is just a beginning, um, but at least at least we're understanding, we're, we're learning more about stigma research. Um, I didn't actually know that there are studies about how to minimize stigma and how to address it. And language and words matter tremendously. And so we have got to be very aware of how we speak to each other, how we speak in the literature and, um, and it's very important. And so now um, I, I, I really appreciate everybody's uh, presentations and everybody, the first part was supposed to be presenting the problem. Um, but in addition to presenting the problem, everybody had suggestions and, and, and uh, thoughts about how to solve the problem, which is great. Uh, it is difficult to take the, the two apart. Um, but I did want to, at this point, talk about some current initiatives that, that have been tried and, and are being tried. Um, and because then that frames what we could do next. So in other words, if we're already doing some things or we, do we need to do them more, do we need to stop, do we need to amplify, et cetera. And so um, I am going to start with what CDC has done and then um, 
Dr. Vicki Whittemore is going to talk about um, NIH's uh, K awards and fellowships, which is only one tiny, tiny aspect of what they're doing. But again, we're focusing on largely educational and workforce development issues right now. And, um, and then I asked Dr. Selinger to uh, talk briefly about his experience introducing uh, MECFS into the medical school curriculum. And, uh, and then I've asked Dr. Aaron Mon uh, to present about the work that the National Association of School Nurses has done uh, uh, related to MECFS and education. Okay, so if we could uh, have my first slide. Um, so I'm going to focus these remarks on the activities that we have done largely since uh, publication of the IOM report in uh, 2015. Do I have the next slide? Um, so I just need to assure everyone that CDC's MECFS program has been really very much aware of this problem and the need for um, improved healthcare and for clinicians that understand MECFS for quite some time. And we've developed activities to educate healthcare providers, particularly those in primary care. And the reason is they are usually the first to encounter patients with MECFS and their families. However, we also considered additional audiences, including public health professionals, the general public, and patients and their families, as we've learned that educated, concerned consumers of healthcare and can help guide their healthcare providers to educational resources. We've used as many different channels or methods as possible to reach this broad audience. Next slide. One of, the, uh, one of our biggest activities related to CDC's public health grand rounds. This is sort of our bully pulpit for getting information out to public health professionals and healthcare providers. The grand rounds, CDC's public health grand rounds have a strong reputation in the community for providing concise, uh, vital information. The topics for these monthly sessions are selected through a very competitive process and we leveraged new information in the 2015 IOM report as the rationale for uh, holding this session. It was a significant accomplishment as it indicated CDC's full commitment to addressing MECFS. It was a one hour session with four speakers. It occurred, uh, participants could view the session live in person as well as webcast and it was also archived online. CME was avail available for two years. The Grand Rounds material was also published in the Mortality, Morbidity, and Weekly Reports with, CMM, with C uh, continuing medical education available. The MMWR is a series prepared by CDC, often called the Voice of CDC, and it's one of our high, most highly accessed publications. Finally, as an, inter an interview with one of the speakers, Dr. Anthony Komarov, was available as a video clip um, in Beyond the Data. And the, these archived materials are still available at the links below. I have the next slide. Uh, CDC has tried a variety of continuing uh, medical education uh, formats. And most recently we partnered with the Medscape. Um, that was because they have the infrastructure to direct these materials to specific medical audiences such as primary care and they can also direct it to specialty care. Currently we have three different course formats available. A roundtable video presenting information through conversations with experts. A case-based learning module that uses actual clinical presentations to direct learning. And a test and teach format engaging learners through questions to test their knowledge. Medscape uh, materials are available free. There is no cost to use them. Medscape also produces expert commentaries from CDC speakers. And we use this opportunity uh, to encourage clinicians to diagnose MECFS. And this was, this is available still on our website. The MedEd Portal is a publication of the American Association of Medical Colleges that provides educational resources for medical school curriculum. Our initial product that we published there focused on the important basic skill of patient interviewing 
using a poorly handled interview of an actor portraying a patient with ME-CFS, that's called the standardized patient, to educate about ME-CFS and to educate new clinicians about the patient interview. Again, we targeted the patient interview as a way to broaden interest of the healthcare community. We sponsored two professional organizations to provide continuing medical educations to their members and provided consultation to third parties about their online information. Um, and uh, there, as somebody noted, getting medical professional organizations to educate their own uh, providers we thought was a, a way to try. Next. The field of MECFS is at times filled with misunderstanding between all stakeholders. Anything that prevents everyone from moving together in the same direction is a barrier to progress. To provide a forum for the various stakeholders to hear each other's voices and thoughts, we've conducted two roundtable meetings. These roundtable meetings were each preceded by small group calls like mini focus group, and then uh, we had the in-person meeting. The, at the meeting, the groups were divided up into tables, including diverse representation to enrich the dialogue. In 2016, the main question was how to induce the IOM clinical case definition. And in 2018, the focus was how to identify needs for health educational materials for patients and providers and to develop content for these toolkits. We also sponsored the stakeholder engagement and communication calls since 2012. The mode of presentation in these calls has been evolving and we've been improving access, but the same format has basically been used. A brief content, a brief introduction of CDC's work followed by a presentation from an outside expert on a topic of interest to the community. And finally, a question and answer period. The next slide. CDC's website is intended to be a web, uh, a resource for all. It is freely available and we hope that all federal agencies will feel free to link to it and, and to use content. We've translated this website into Spanish to improve our outreach to this population. The website was developed with substantial input from all stakeholders and is continually updated. Next slide. So I just wanna thank all members of uh, CDC's MECFS program for their excellent work in this, in this area and to my division leadership for their support. We think that consideration needs to be made as to how to make these activities sustainable. Um, we see a lack of interest on the part of healthcare providers as a barrier that we cannot overcome alone. And one of the, oh, I think it was uh, Lily Chu's comment was CDC can't do this alone. That is absolutely true. We need, we need to collaborate and work together. As noted by several speakers, and uh, as we're gonna be discussing tomorrow, uh, recognition of long COVID has brought much needed attention to the field of post-infectious post fatiguing illnesses. And uh, we look forward to uh, continued work. And thank you. And that's all for this slides. Um, and so could we switch to Vicky's? And then uh, after, uh, I guess after all of them, we'll be having time for discussion and questions. Thank you, Beth. Could I have my slides please? And while my slides are coming up, I just would like to start by saying thank you to everyone who's participating today. I think hearing from all the stakeholders is critically important. And um, as Beth just said, it's going to take all of us working together to make these changes and make, make progress. Um, and uh, what, what I'm going to talk about today are NIH grant mechanisms that really are in place to help build clinician scientists. Um, and these are not certainly the only grant mechanisms at NIH, but as Dr. Korshetz also pointed out, this is just only one small piece of how we can help to influence the development of new young investigators who are also clinicians and, and care, can learn about MECFS and provide healthcare to individuals with MECFS. So if I can have my next slide, please. 
So as I'm sure you all know, NIH is made up of 27 different components called institutes and centers, and each has its own specific research agenda, often focusing on particular diseases or body systems. Um, I'm, at, as um, Dr. Koroshetz is the director of NINDS, are in the Neurological Disorders and Stroke Institute, which focuses, as the name implies, on neurological disorders. So each institute has what we call an intramural component, which are the labs that are on the NIH campus or in some other locations in the country, where research is actually taking place, like the intramural group at the NIH Clinical Center that are carrying on the intramural study on MECFS. And then there's the extramural component, which is the group that where I work at NINDS that supports research grants to investigators at all level, levels of career development throughout the United States and often in foreign countries as well. And in the next slide, um, all of the program directors with an interest in MECFS um, participate in the Trans NIH MECFS Working Group, which was restructured. <clears throat> <laughs> excuse me, in 2015, and we coordinate research activities across the NIH. So it's chaired by Dr. Koroshetz, and it's composed of, composed of representatives from 23 institutes, centers, and offices. So the program directors on the Trans NIH Working Group from the institutes are available to talk to investigators, assist with the grant application process, as well as to really try to think about how to advance and stimulate and support research on MECFS. The group also includes representatives from the Center for Scientific Review. And you can see a list of the individuals who are on this trans NIH working group um, if you go to this link. And in the next slide, so all of the institutes and centers and all of the program directors on the trans NIH working group are well aware of this path of career development that is supported in institutes, in all of the institutes at NIH. So we support research all the way from undergraduate and post-baccalaureate education through pre-doctoral -doc training, post-doctoral training, through to, um, sorry, I, the chat pops up and then I can't see my slides, um, to early research career development and then invis investigator development and, and career development. So um, this is sort of the career development phase. Again, as you all know, we, we also support peer-reviewed research that comes into the NIH as investigator-initiated awards from junior as well as established investigators. And in the next slide, I'm going to specifically focus on K awards for clinician scientists since the focus of today's discussion is on building health, the healthcare professional workforce. So career development awards are awards for candidates who wish to further develop their careers in biomedical, behavioral, and clinical research. The applicants are generally required to hold a research or health professional doctoral degree or its equivalent, and eligibility in some, for some of these awards may be limited to only those with the health professional doctoral degree, for example, an MD, but not all, and it provides protected time for clinician scientists so they can focus on research while also performing clinical duties, and it provides support for basic or clinical research studies. So at NINDS, we have a very hefty number of, um, if you could go back, please. We have a hefty program um, in our training office that supports numerous K awards across the neurological diseases. And I oversee many of these K awards in the epilepsies, which is the other area of research I cover. As I, far as I can see, the NIH has never received an application for a K award. Um, and so that is telling in that the academics, physicians who are in departments are not encouraging young investigators to apply for these kinds of awards 
where they could begin to develop their clinical or basic research studies while still seeing patients and learning about clinical care for individuals with ME-CFS. So in the next slide, this is a rundown of the various K awards and not to bore you with going through each of these in detail. Um, I'll just say that there are many different career awards that career development awards that can help to support investigators in those early stages after they've finished their medical training. So many of the K awards um, that come to NINDS are KO8s or Mentored Clinical Scientist Awards, where it provides the opportunity for the individual to have a training and, and mentored period of time where they can begin to develop those research skills before they go out to become independent investigators and clinicians. There are others that are um, as the K23 that are specifically oriented toward um, patient-oriented research. So it's not all basic research. It can be focused on clinical research. Um, and so there are many different ways and different opportunities here for individuals, even the K24, which is a more mid-career investigator award for clinicians who want to do some research to get these kinds of awards at NIH and to be supported. And again, what this allows is protected time for the individual to develop those research skills. So in the next slide, please. The other avenue is what we call the early stage investigators. And these are program directors or investigators who've completed their terminal research degree or the end of their postdoctoral clinical training, whichever dates later within the past 10 years, who've previously competed successfully as a, um, who have not, sorry, previously competed successfully for an independent, like an R01 or an independent NIH grant to submit R01 equivalent grants, and when they're funded, to um, develop, go on to develop those careers. In most institutes at NIH, there's a significant bump in the pay line for these early stage investigators. So for example, at NINDS, our pay line, when the pay line's at the 14th percentile, we look at and evaluate and fund early stage investigators almost 10 percentile points above that pay line. So it really is um, a, a way in which early career investigators can also, basic scientists and clinical scientists can really launch their careers as well. And the next slide, please. So I'll just end by talking about what a program director does and how we can help. And so we, are, as I said, in the trans-NIH working group, there are 23 individuals who are, represent the different institutes, and we are ready and available to talk to investigators at all levels of their careers to provide information about funding opportunities, what's the best grant mechanism, to help you review the specific aims for your grant applications, we then listen to the review and discuss the summary statements so we understand if the grant does not score well, what were, the, what were the key weaknesses and how can you improve your application? We helped investigators to answer questions and navigate the NIH system. And then of course we administer the grant when it's awarded. Um, there is a, a matchmaker tool on the NIH website. So if you're studying the Im immune system, neurology in MECFS, GI system, you can go to Matchmaker and it will identify individuals who are, have grants in those similar areas that you're interested in exploring. And in the next slide, if all else fails, you can contact me. Um, I'm ready and available and I have to say, probably in the last three months, I've had conversations with young investigators as well as established investigators in MECFS at least two or three a week. So the, I think the gratifying thing in the research field is that there is growing interest. Um, there is growing um, awareness of the opportunities available at NIH. 
um, for to support research on MECFS and growing awareness that we are very interested in supporting this work and awareness that we as program directors, that's our job is to help investigators. Um, and the bottom line here is that I think we need to reach out to the academic centers and make them help to make them aware of the significant need to build this pipeline of investigators and that one way we can do this is through these K, K awards and these career development awards. So I'll, I'll stop there and thank you, Beth. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, so again, we'll uh, have more time for discussion after uh, these presentations. And, but I'm, is Dr. Selinger, are you at a place where you'll be able to do your presentation? Yes, I am. Okay, and um, the presentation will be advanced by Monica. So you just have to let her know when you're ready to move to the next slide. Well, you can move. We're gonna talk about MECFS at the undergraduate medical level. Hopefully you can all hear me. I'll take the next slide. So I chair family medicine, the Frank Netter School of Medicine. The school was started by a donation from the famous anatomist uh, estate, Frank Netter. We're a new breed of medical school, launched in 2013, graduated our first class in 2017. You need to understand that unlike your typical Im uh, image of a healthcare center, all clinical training happens in the community, both ambulatory and inpatient. There is no faculty practice. There is no on-site university medical center. At this time, there's no robust research. It's all about teaching at the undergraduate medical level, which has its pros and its cons. This was done to not compete with the medical community. But obviously, as was talked about earlier, we do not have a robust research infrastructure and your classic academic clinician. Uh, our class size is 90 to 95, not insignificant. And I need to be transparent with everyone that this curriculum would not have happened if we had not been funded by a very generous octogenarian who has lived with MECFS for many years and made a six-figure contribution to uh, endow the chair of family medicine matched by the medical school uh, with the request that we create an undergraduate medical curriculum. And that is why we created an undergraduate medical curriculum. Um, there were no barriers encountered, which by that I mean, it doesn't go through curriculum committee on oversight. And let me tell you, curriculum, um, there's a lot of turf battles that go on as what's gonna get accepted as curricular content. We were able to move this through ancillary departments within the medical school rather than the basic foundations of medicine. And that is what enabled us to offer first year, second year, and third year um, on-site training in MECFS. I'll take the next slide. Next slide. So what we're looking at here is in the first year, you've got young medical students. They are still well aware of their lives outside of medicine. And so we, we present to them uh, patients and families um, that are living with this on a daily basis. Our goal is really to humanize um, the experience for students. Um, the exper Go ahead. Sorry, Monica, I think she's one slide ahead of you. Yeah, can you back up, please? I'm still going to verbalize that that is our goal, but I'll, I'll back up. So our goal is to huma humanize this for our students who are still receptive to the humanity involved in dealing with chronic illness. I hate to say it, but that receptivity tends to diminish over the course of four years of medical school. Um, as you are forced to engage with a more rigid healthcare system. In the second year, we really focus on objective structured clinical reasoning, as described here, where you have to consider a variety of differential diagnoses, of which MECFS -E is one. That means you introduce a patient with a standardized patient, 
who has a, a script around why they're there, what they're suffering with, what their clinical concerns are, their chief complaint. You go through an examination and the second year students are expected to consider based on readings done prior to this session, MECFS, among other things, that are equally significant um, in producing fatigue or unrefreshing sleep and practice the ability to distinguish different diagnoses from one another. Um, in the third year, what we basically do is offer a straight didactic as our students are now out in the community, rotating through inpatient and outpatient uh, programs. And this, I'll show you some representative slides later, but this is an opportunity to drive home the recognition that you don't always have clear-cut criteria and clear-cut diagnostic algorithms and treatment algorithms out in the real world with real people. These three years have been deployed. The fourth year would have been deployed, but the pandemic hit, and that's a funded four-week away rotation for anyone who wants it um, at one of the MECFS centers throughout the country. We hope once the pandemic restrictions are lifted to be able to locate students who would be interested in that. Take the next slide, please. Right. Um, and I've already said that about medical education often de-emphasizing the patient-centeredness focus. Next slide, please. So deductive clinical reasoning, hypothesis driven in the second year, which I've alluded to. Next slide. And in the third year, I want to show you some representative slides of every student rotates through a primary care clerkship so that every student in each of these years is exposed to this, this uh, perspective on a complex clinical condition that is not easily codified. Next slide, please. So to give you an idea of what we stress, and this is obviously my department and the students rotating through, we really try to push the point, just as it says here, be a detective, be a clinician, don't roll your eyes. And then we try to make it very relevant to the current times about how there are many similarities expressed by Tony Fauci and others between COVID long haulers and how that's going to magnify the numbers of people that may fall within this diagnostic and clinical category uh, exponentially. Next slide. Uh, again, we share with the students, here's what patients suffer through, how many doctors they need to see. And again, these are third years out in the community in their primary care rotation, which is ambulatory. Next slide, please. And, and here again, we try to drive the message home. It is not psychiatric. It is not deconditioning. Don't do the exercise by just, you know, all these things which are counter to what some students may think is appropriate. And this, this lecture, this 60 minute lecture also includes the diagnostic criteria, the Nasoline test, the post-exertional malaise, staying within your energy envelope, some of the medications that are used to mitigate the symptomatology. So because they're third years in the community, we want them to understand what it's like to have hands-on and we have not yet been able to query them as to how many may have actually believed they've seen this. Next slide, please. Right, so as Osler said, listen to these patients and we stress the patient-centeredness in the primary care rotation. It's, you know, the, the exam is often used to validate the history. And again, this message of don't have premature closure in your thinking, keep your thought processes open, be deductive, 
but don't close the door on what you believe to be going on. And finally, last slide, I believe. And that alludes to what we hope to launch once things are opened up again for interested fourth year students. And the key here is you hear about it in year one, again in year two, again in year three. So the longitudinal re-exposure is what's so important. And I'm told we're the only school doing this, but you also need to recognize the limitations of a school like ours where there's no on-site university academic medical center. Um, it only just started uh, right prior to the pandemic. And hopefully, well, this spring will be our second M1 and we probably our third M2 next fall and our, and our ongoing M3 because those students are rotating through this year every four weeks because they were not out in the clinical setting in the future every six weeks. So that's what we're about at the undergraduate medical level. Thank you. And could you comment uh, uh, if you had to go to the curriculum uh, chairman or uh, to get approval to do this? I, I honestly think pre-COVID, we would have been turned down and said, we're sorry, there's not enough capacity in the curriculum to accommodate this disease because it's very, very hard to break into the formal curriculum. But when you do it in a way that's rotational based in the third year or clinical arts and sciences, which is a separate department in the second year, or SRCC, which is another second afternoon evidence-based medicine department in the first year, you kind of skirt the curriculum committee on oversight. And that's exactly right. what we did. Yeah, and uh, when, I, when I talked with you earlier, I thought that was a very ingenious uh, way to do it. You can incorporate it without um, specific uh, approval. Right. <laughs> just, yeah. Um, right. So Nancy, if you have a quick comment, then we need to go to um, Aaron. You're on mute. I was saying the case-based learning is very common now in medical curricula. So we provided a case for the case-based learning section of the freshman year curricula. And that was very well received. And now um, it drives a lot more people into our elective. Right. And in our first year, what we did is we, we part of this afternoon session included the students. They were required in a collaborative classroom environment to look up various clinical questions directly related to MECFS. The goal there was how does one learn how to research the evidence and then present this to the group as a whole after the patient and family exposure, which occurred in the first hour. That was the direction we chose to take. I guess the case base would be the OSCE, the observed structured clinical exam in the second year, but then again, that's more deductive reasoning. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yep. Um, and could we move now to Aaron uh, Mon, who uh, is representing the National Association of School Nurses? Wonderful, thanks. Thank you so much. And I appreciate this opportunity to share what we've done. I've also appreciated hearing from um, those of you who suffer from MECFS and getting that patient perspective. It's extremely helpful. Um, so just as a little bit of background, the National Association of School Nurses is a membership organization. We represent um, all the nurses that work in both public or private schools, mostly kindergarten through grade 12, but many schools are beginning to have a pre-K program and we welcome them as well as members. We have about 17,000 members in our um, association, but we also Part of our mission, which is to optimize student health, is to push out information to all school nurses, not just our members. Each of our, each state has a chapter, or we call it an affiliate, that has local leadership, and we use that network often to try and get information out to all school nurses, uh, not just our members. I thought also to, oh, if you can advance to the next slide, please. 
I thought it might also be helpful to kind of share how school nursing is in the United States. You may or may not be aware of this, but about 25% of schools do not have any type of school nurse. That's the sad news. The good news though, is that 75% do have a school nurse. It might not be full-time and it really depends a lot where, where in the country you are, will depend if that nurse is full-time versus part-time or, or not at all. Um, it also influences their education level sometimes, uh, be it if they are registered nurse with a, at least a baccalaureate degree, that is our recommendation from the National Association of School Nurses, or if they have an associate registered nurse degree or in the South, I will say there seems to be a little bit more of licensed practical or licensed vocational nurses mm -hmm. working in the schools. Um, we, and we're, we're glad that there's nurses. We try to, we welcome all and try to get the information out to all of them. So why Dr. Enger had asked for me to speak today was I think because of a program that she's alluded to where we've been really trying to increase the surveillance of our school nurses to watch for MECFS. And part of that program is to provide education to our school nurses. If you could advance to the next slide, please. I just wanna share the process that we followed. So the, the program started about in 2018 and we the first question we asked was, had school nurses heard of MECFS? And the far majority had not. So this kind of support Courts, uh, unfortunately, what I've heard in the discussion today about it just people aren't aware of it. And we really took that to heart because one of the barriers, and I'm a former school nurse, love being a school nurse, but I definitely think one of the barriers is once out of school, it's, um, it's really upon the school nurse or, or a nurse in other profession too, to keep up to date on information. And I know MECFS has been around for a while, but there's also been new advances. And if it's not on someone's radar, it's very difficult to know to make sure they keep up to date on it. So we knew first and foremost, we needed to set the context of what MECFS was um, in order that school nurses also were more likely to be receptive to it. As one of the speakers spoke this morning, um, the providers, it's those that seemed, if I understood correctly, those that um, were more receptive were the ones that had some type of a personal connection with MECFS. So I think that's true too. Luckily when this program started, um, the documentary Unrest was on Netflix. And so we actually um, really tried to promote having them watch that to understand really what it was like and understand um, the signs and symptoms and just how debilitating it can be in, one per in, in a person's life. Um, to kind of set the context for additional education. Because of the surveillance program, we have a state data coordinator in each state. It's a voluntary position. And we started with them because they um, work with their affiliates and are able to push information out. Uh, again, we did a needs assessment for them and they hadn't heard about MECFS. So that was really important. Using the information that um, CDC has, which is wonderful for schools, we promoted that information. We actually promoted the Medscape CME course that was mentioned earlier as well. And then we had a breakout session at our 2019 conference that was recorded and um, was made, been made into a webinar that is still on our website and we still continue to promote that. We have training sites for our surveillance group and we also did specific training for them in those local areas we picked or we chose states that have specialists in MECFS and we provided the information of who those specialists were and encouraged them to connect locally um, with those organizations so that because the pilot sites were looking specifically to identify students that may have undiagnosed MECFS um, or diagnosed. So uh, we tried to connect where we could. A little bit of information that I thought might be helpful. I just wanna make sure I've Oh, and the other thing, yes, I apologize. One other thing that we did from an educational perspective is we have a weekly electronic digest that goes out beyond our members. It goes to about 35,000 um, school health interested people, including school nurses. And we pushed information out there as well. Uh, just a lot of it is just trying to get the awareness. And for school nurses, it's helping them identify what the signs and symptoms are so that they are aware so that they can work with parents who um, may or may not be aware uh, to, to even consider MECFS 
and then to help them link into a specialist and to work with parents as much as they can. Also in addressing things on the school side, I saw one of the patient quotes was the frustration found working in schools. And unfortunately we have heard of that as well. On the flip side, we've also heard, well, I should back up to say context is part of it. I think some of the rules on how um, chronic conditions are managed in schools, it's very much based on having a, an official diagnosis. And I think from this program, we've learned how difficult that is because for, for children or students, it's six, at least six months. And so um, one of our pilot sites, although I will say we haven't found any students with MECFS that have been um, diagnosed or have been identified because of our program, um, they might, anyway, it's a long story. I'll, I'll talk about that if you're interested. I'm sticking on education here. But the point is, is that we have um, been able to work with districts in preparation and that in some districts, they are able to um, work with their, they, their home and hospital, which is oftentimes with a diagnosis, but can be for other things too, to help try and coordinate and work with students even before they have a diagnosis. Because like I say, that's the traditional way school nurses and school health is addressed is by diagnosis. And that's not always possible. I know it's been mentioned a lot, but um, I would say a silver lining, if you want to say, of COVID is definitely that it has increased. And we've tried to highlight the various information about COVID being um, connected with MECFS and the importance for school nurses to really be even more on their toes to help identify symptoms and to talk to parents and families about that, to work with them from the school level if they're in schools, many of them are virtual right now, as well as, like I say, helping them uh, get into further treatment and diagnosis so that further treatment can be uh, identified. We're hoping, we'll continue to push that too. We also have a, a case, it's a chronic condition management manual that's coming out. And um, in that we've included a case study specifically on MECFS undiagnosed first in another attempt to try and help school nurses know what kind of questions to ask, what kind of things to look for that kind of information in hopes that if, if, since we know so many A don't know what MECFS was, we pushed that first. And now, like I say, we also wanna give the tools to school nurses so they know what to look for. And then with that, just a little bit of information, we do, do, did do an evaluation on our, those that have participated in the webinar. And um, we're encouraged on a liquor scale of one to five, five being the highest it can be, 4.5 felt like after the presentation and information that they felt much confident in being able to identify symptoms that might be um, MECFS, so that's good. 4.39 felt that they had the tools to advocate for changes as needed related to MECFS. And 4.45, again, these are all out of a Likert scale of five, um, felt that the information influenced their practice and they would make changes. So we feel like that's going in the right direction but also definitely feel a need to continue. And especially after listening today um, and using the opportunity that COVID has provided in discussing it. And unfortunately that it might increase the rates that we really need to make sure school nurses are on top of things um, in knowing what MECFS is and what signs and symptoms to look for and to connect with the specialists in their area and to know what this, how they can support students and their families um, even before the diagnosis in addressing school issues, especially because we also feel that there'll be an increase in anxiety, school anxiety, which oftentimes MECFS is misdiagnosed and they, they put it to that. Um, and so we, we do wanna address the anxiety, but we don't want that to be um, stopping the situation and that we they really look into to make sure that the correct causes and symptoms and um, condition is diagnosed so that proper treatment can be um, given. And that is all, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, so if we could, um, are, are there any questions or comments about these last uh, four uh, presentations before we open up for a general discussion? So Beth, we okay. do have we do have one question, which is what inspired NASN to implement this MECFS education program? Sure, it was actually because we received a contract from from the CDC to do it particularly, 
And I'm grateful that we did because it was an honor rater like it should have been. So we appreciate the opportunity. And um, I don't want to take away, but since I'm answering, if for those, I would love if in the chat, because I don't want to take away from discussion, but would really appreciate those that have worked with schools, any feedback or information that would be helpful. So as we move forward, we can make sure that um, the school nurses better understand um, maybe what questions to ask or if they're aware of how things have been mis people have felt mistreated or not gotten the attention they need, how we can address that better. So I just wanted to throw that out as well. Thank you. Okay, great. And there's, there's actually a couple more for you as well. Um, can you restate the number of school nurses reached to this point and the locations of the nurses? Thank you for this great initiative. Great. So um, I think maybe so there's kind of two parts. The pilot sites, that's where there's a specific reach in that they're working in six different um, districts. Two of them are in Utah. One is in Florida. One is, um, or two in, are in Michigan, I'm sorry. And one is in Massachusetts districts that are working on it. And I will say we had, this was the year that, um, that they were supposed to really expand both within the districts we've been working with and beyond those districts. And COVID has definitely impacted that, just the bandwidth. Um, the original pilot nurses are still working and we have um, expanded it some, but not like just to one or two more, or just, um, honestly, because COVID was not what we expected. In regards to the education, however, that has gone out to all um, our members for sure and beyond. So there are 17,000 school nurses who are members of NASIN, but our information has been pushed to through our affiliates. It doesn't necessarily get to every single one, but it gets to um, many, many more than that. Okay, and then we have, we have one more for you, which was, have you experienced any pushback among your regional physician support? No, we haven't. In fact, I, I will say I reached out to, I gave it, um, when we were doing this, I, I gave the choice to our pilot sites if they chose to reach out, because some of them actually had already um, had connections with their specialists, or if they preferred me to kind of do the initial. And the ones that I did the initial for, I actually got a very nice um, response back um, with willingness to help however they could. And then I linked them into the, to the pilot sites and let them take it. Um, we've encouraged them to have presentations at their state affiliate meetings. Um, again, COVID has kind of messed all of that up. So I can certainly re-encourage because um, uh, a lot, even last year, they're usually in the spring, and even last year, many of the conferences were canceled due to COVID. Um, but no real pushback um, from the providers that I have heard, at least. Most of them have been, well, from what I have heard, kind of like many of our, the specialists, of course, know, but some of the primary providers have also not really heard of MECFS, and so that's what um, the school nurses have indicated we use the, the fact sheets that have been so nice that CDC created and we encourage the school nurses to share those with providers and families um, to help educate and we've heard positive feedback that they weren't aware of it so they appreciated having it on their radar. Great. Okay. Uh, Nanda, it uh, looks like you have a, would like to make a comment. We're not hearing you. Could you try again? Hmm. Well, um, Monica, maybe you could help Nanda sort this out because she's going to be giving a talk fairly soon. So we have to be able to hear her. <laughs> um, but meanwhile, um, uh, let's see. Uh, hey, Nanda, can you put something in the chat if you can hear us? Um, because it looks like your audio is connected or else try to call into your dial-in line. Oh, so you got, oh, I can hear you fine. Okay. Um, okay, so let's do this. If you can press the, um, it's either down or up arrow on your mute button and go ahead and test your speaker and microphone so it can find the output. 
my question or should I just go later? Please go ahead. Okay. Um, I actually had a question for Dr. Selinger. Um, thank you so much for speaking about the integration of MECFS in the medical school curriculum. Um, I was just thinking about how uh, I also saw standardized patients uh, maybe more long ago than I'd like to admit, but it, how much it would have opened up my eyes as a student to be able to evaluate a patient with MECFS. Uh, one of the things that they used to talk about um, in clinical in clinical classes is, you know, if you hear hooves, don't always think of horses, it might be a zebra. And it's just, it just goes to say that it's not necessarily the first thing you think of that in the differential that might be the actual problem. And I think it's a really great way to establish that narrative early on in their medical training to have that. Um, and, and as you said, not to close the door, especially. Uh, I was actually curious to know if um, the medical school is or is planning to follow a cohort of those medical students over time as they, uh, for lack of a better word, go out into the world and kind of monitor uh, their knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs about MECFS. At this time, there's been no plan to do a postgraduate evaluation. That's a very nice idea. Um, you know, everything's been derailed by the pandemic. That had not occurred to us. We were barely able to get this launch. Um, and I think that's excellent. Again, even the faculty, you know, had a tough time when we did the first OSCE. to hear him but yeah I, I like he said that yeah. maybe later on they'll do it but they can't because of everything that's going on now yes yeah okay. um and uh dr selinger i'm sorry you are you were cutting out and maybe dropped off entirely so maybe when you log in we if there's another uh he can comment um uh, a little bit later so it, can you it, hear me now yes yes go ahead yeah, I'm sorry, it's tough. I just said that it's still considered a diagnosis of exclusion, even amongst clinical colleagues, and e even when you front load a clinical case with very clear diagnostic criteria, antecedent viral illness, post-exertional malaise, unrefreshing sleep, there's still this attitude that you've got to rule out every possible organic etiology before you then begin to consider this. So that's a battle we still need to fight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And any other comments before we move to general discussion? And uh, the, the, the idea of this discussion is to, you know, now we've seen what we've done, what, what has been tried, and um, what are the next steps that we should take together? What are some suggestions? And um, that's what this work group is supposed to uh, really really do. So, buddy, want to start? We could maybe go back to um, Ovid's slide, which had some discussion points on. Um, and we're... Uh, we just navigate to them. Yeah, we're going to... Um, Lead, uh, leave a little bit of time at the end. We we do want to review where uh, we're at with this with the uh, systematic review and uh, discuss NIH's plans for um, a workshop. So, but um, and I and Christine, have we been sort of answering the questions as we go along, or there are a lot more? Um, some of them. Okay. Um, I think, you know, some that have been directed at specific people, like I see Aaron is going in and doing a few. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, we are, we're, we're noting down the ones on long COVID uh, mm -hmm. to, to address tomorrow. 
uh, but there are still quite a few. Okay. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, anybody want to start with some comments? Anybody? I will start. I just want to say as a practicing primary care boots on the ground family physician and now teaching students and residents, I think we have to acknowledge that we won't make actionable change, at least in this regard, until we link the new reimbursement approach with its focus on time and complexity uh, to a disease like ME-CFS and get the word out there so that it penetrates the minds of busy primary care physicians who really aren't thinking about it. And, and most of them are now owned by hospital systems and healthcare insurers, not all, and, and drive the message home that this does not have to be a financially losing proposition. As crass as it sounds, I think it's going to be an essential element. Mm. Yes, yeah, so that, that's in a way addressing some of the structural barriers, which is reimbursement and, um, you know, how can we what sorts of uh, clinical uh, approaches are, are most effective? Dr. Korshetz, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, no, I really appreciate uh, hearing all the efforts that people have taken um, it's, and, and, and realizing how tough it is. I, I think that it's possible that one silver lining to the epidemic is that many of these issues with regard to the care of people with MECFS may dissipate. I say that because um, in preparing the research for post-COVID syndrome, um, we've been talking to doctors from all over the country and, and most hospitals now are actually starting clinics, particularly for people who had COVID and are not better and the overlap in symptoms is pretty dramatic. Um, so people, most of the people who are running these clinics, you know, had no experience with uh, MECFS, um, but they are on a steep learning curve and mm -hmm. they will be, you know, within a year or two, uh, a cadre of, uh, of medical professionals that could be um, really, really helpful in helping to take care of people who have MECFS who, you know, did not have COVID. Right. But I think that's one, we're in a special place now. Um, it's not, I mean, it's terrible about the pandemic, but yeah. <laughs> right. there, is, there is certainly a possibility that this could be a game changer I um, for those who are suffering with MECFS. Yes, I've had more clinicians tell me, you know, I'll, admit, well, there's lots that we don't understand and have much more of an open mind. And one of the barriers that we've, CDC has sensed with our uh, continuing medical education is how to get clinicians interested. And the COVID is, the, and, the, and the numbers of patients with this kind of uh, problem could be the impetus to, to get people interested. So now we've got a number of, of hands. So could we go to um, Charmian? I think maybe yours was first. Sorry if I'm calling out of order. And you're on mute. This is funny because I see Charmian, Mary, and Ben, and I'm pretty sure we may all have the same comment. <laughs> <laughs> and from the MECFS uh, patient perspective, the concern is that long COVID will be seen as a separate entity, all of its own, and that the symptoms will be what they are. And it won't matter that they are very similar or the same symptoms that people with MECFS are experiencing today. MECFS will be left out of the discussion and will be pushed aside and left behind once again. Yes. And I, think, I think that is the, the key 
challenge from the MECFS patient voice perspective that we have to make sure that that doesn't happen and that long COVID doesn't become its own thing. Yes. And MECFS fades away. Yes, we, uh, I, and, and that and I, sort of is number, uh, was that number four, needed focus on long COVID leave MECFS patients behind again. We cannot, I agree totally, and CDC has been doing what we can to emphasize that. And I believe the NIH language is very inclusive as well. And we just need to keep emphasizing that because the very worst thing that could happen is that uh, long COVID is one thing and MECFS is another and that the MECFS patients need to, uh, to benefit from this. We were on a call with WHO about long COVID and this is long COVID not workforce development, but, um, and uh, they said uh, they didn't want to leave the long COVID patients behind. And all I could think of is, well, we can't, you know, what has the MECFS community has been left behind and we need to catch them up. Uh, so I agree. So uh, Ben? I'll let Mary go before me. Okay, <laughs> I, Mary. Uh, you can go ahead, Mary. Thanks, Ben. Um, I was gonna come back to what Dr. Korsh had said these long COVID clinics are being set up all over the place and in a couple of years they'll know quite a bit but we can actually expedite what they're learning by taking advantage of what these clinicians who are already treating MECFS have learned over the last 30 years and doing that is going to provide going to require some sponsorship some funding to support them communicating but I could easily imagine a um comprehensive program that would provide that kind of knowledge base that we already have out to those clinics. So rather than it being two years, we actually have them um, treating patients the way we need them to in a year or six months. Um, we do know, this is important because we do know that some of these clinics are recommending exercise, saying that patients are just anxious if there's no evidence of organ damage, et cetera. And so I think it'll be really important to help them learn what's already been, been learned as quickly as possible. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just keep my comment really brief, picking back in on what Mary said from my, um, uh, uh, the, the negative lining I would see uh, the uh, ME action has, and you know, Beth, I know we, we spoke with your CDC team um, well, at the end of last year about this, but we've been tracking a lot of the long hauler um, press coverage and um, the, the clinics that are popping up, the, the, um, and um, I would say, I, I do not see that, that, that silver, unfortunately, I don't see that silver lining right now because I think it is very uneven. Um, and, and there is actually, um, you know, I think actual harm that's potentially going on in long COVID clinics where MECFS um, people who have developed MECFS from COVID are coming and not getting effective treatment for their disease. Um, and so I think that is Mary's points to what we can do about that are really important now, because I would say from, from the work we've tried to survey the ground, we, I, I, would, um, I do not think all the long COVID clinics are up to a, a knowledge of MECFS. And so the question is, what can we do to change that? Thank you. Okay. And, and Ovid? Thank you. Uh, I just uh, I wanted to, to go back to Dr. Korsh's uh, a comment. I think we do agree that there's a, there's a potential uh, here to, uh, to really uh, um, make a difference, uh, you know, of the kind that we were all talking about um, on the first part of the conversation today. But I think ultimately that requires a, a, a really a co coordinated effort. I think that we realize that the challenge has been uh, very large even before COVID and it's just uh, growing, uh, growing now. And uh, you know, to to, uh, to Dr. Selinger's point before, um, of course, it's important to uh, to teach the medical students, and, and that's really the time to to do that. Now, in the past, it's possible that uh, physicians were not interested or they didn't think that MECFS is something they should be aware of. With long COVID, that is no longer acceptable, uh, and, and I don't think that's really going to be uh, really going to be true. So the question is, how do we uh, really have a uh, have an effort? Uh, that en encompasses all those different aspects. And I think what, uh, what we take from uh, the discussion uh, this morning is that uh, it is all uh, interconnected. Uh, Dr. Klimas has talked about the, the need for, uh, for clinical research. 
um, and uh, the, the challenge in, in attracting uh, people to, uh, to come to a clinic that doesn't have uh, research opportunities. So we have to address all of, all of those aspects in a, in a coordinated way. If we just let things uh, grow organically over the next two years, I'm very concerned that we're going to see a, 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 the, the problem of growing even, even bigger than it is today. Yeah. So it's, it really is difficult to have a conversation about MECFS without getting into long COVID, but we are trying. And tomorrow is when we're really going to focus on, on long COVID and talk about how the agencies are working together as well as with WHO to try to a, address this and um, and then when we can uh, focus more on how to make sure we get MECFS included with all of the benefits and the funding that's going to come with long COVID. Um, so gonna, and maybe there's that one, so one, yes. one, uh, one specific comment that I wanted to make, uh, to make uh, and this is uh, to this question number five, how can we do things differently? Yes. Um, and, and I think that over the past year, I mean, we've all changed the way we work. We're now, uh, you know, resuming this, this conversation probably would have been done uh, differently in a, in a, in a different yes. thing. Um, but I, I've been following the emergence of, of uh, this branch of e-consulting, uh, which is really uh, the way that organizations, uh, many of them are for-profit organizations, uh, provide um, medical consulting to primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of think about it as, uh, you know, uh, Uber for, uh, for medical doctors, but uh, it's sort of this idea that you can uh, use experts uh, really specifically based on, on physicians' needs. Uh, there are a number of these organizations now, and that could be a very efficient way to educate um, uh, many, many physicians uh, in the primary care uh, setting uh, by contracting those kind of organizations in a similar way to what you did with Medscape and others. Um, I think there's a, uh, these are relatively uh, cost-effective ways to educate a large number of physicians. Uh, to something that uh, at this point they would uh, they would feel um, eager to learn more about. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, Dr. Korshets. Well, thank you. I think uh, all good points. Um, I, I just wanted to raise one other one, which I I I, I raise it with every disease advocacy group that we meet with, um, most of which have a very similar problem, maybe not as acute, but similar in, in not being able to find the caregivers that they need. And um, I just think back to, to how people's careers in medicines evolve. And, and I think that there are these tipping points in people's careers where, you know, for one reason or another, they decide to go in one direction or the other. And um, I think that uh, it's, the, it's the experience that the young people have with the patients and actually the disease organizations that can have a tremendous uh, leverage there. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, think, um, I think we, we can't really underestimate the power of, uh, of the groups that are on the call today who represent the patients uh, in their ability to, um, to convince people, young, young physicians, nurses, neuropsychologists, whatever, that this is a, a really important um, and needy area to go into. Uh, at the government level, we have basically zero leverage, to tell you the truth, yes. uh, in terms of determining what people, what kind of careers are going to go into. Uh, and just looking back to my career, you know, I really didn't have any, um, I didn't really have, you know, I didn't really have any expectations going in one disease or the other, but I just ran into these people from the Huntington Disease Foundation, and they were so compelling, you know, that I put my career uh, into Huntington's disease. Um, had a lot of stigma in those days. People with Huntington's disease were locked up in their 
in houses so no one could see them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was nothing that we knew about the disease. Um, but it was really these inter- personal interactions with the disease organization folks that really made a difference. And I wasn't the only one. It was really um, a lot of other people who went the same direction because of that organization. So I would not underestimate what you guys can do um, to get people into the field, but but to target the young people is mm-hmm. is the key. You know, once the people are out in practice, it's a it's a tough sell. So so uh, I agree and. Um... The one of the one of the questions raised here is what agencies need to be in uh, in this meeting that aren't here. And I do want to explain um, we have invited um, others to join. And right at the moment, there has not been enough uh, uh, bandwidth for people from the FDA or HRQ to join us. But we are reaching out to them, and uh, I think it's important. Uh, that we have as many of the agencies as, as involved as possible. Um, uh, we also got a suggestion from uh, Charmian to include the Indian Health Service, uh, which is a good idea. And um, we need connections often uh, with these agencies. In other words, who is the right person to talk to? So it, sometimes it takes us a little while to, to make the right connections. Um, we do... Uh, uh, one one option to really try to come up with, you know, our idea is like, well, what should we, how should we, what program should we do, what, how should we emphasize what we're doing, anything new we should undertake, um, and so one of uh, one of our thoughts was that perhaps we need to have a a working sort of subcommittee of this to to discuss offline. Uh, some of these issues. In other words, we can't do everything today. Um, that's just a suggestion. Um, let's see. So there's a lot of hands up. Are they all, are the, is, Dr. Korosic, did you still have something new? No, okay. Um, Charmian, did you have something new? Okay. Yes, I just wanted to add HRSA. As HRSA, one. yes, okay. Uh, if we If we are going to make any effort to, any realistic effort to reach out to underserved communities, the Community Health Center Network is the yes. way to go. Yes, and we've, we've actually, you know, I've learned a lot by talking with some of the community health centers and the constraints that they're under, and it's going to call for some really creative thought as to how we can develop uh, systems that will uh, allow for care of these patients, um, very complex patients under under those circumstances. No. And uh, so Nancy, did you have a comment? It was a good segue because actually my, my question of the governmental bodies that are here is just how do we support the clinical care network, um, perhaps on the backbone of the clinical research network or in some merged way, I know right now that HRSA is about the only place you can send direct clinical money to, and yet that's going to be only working through these community care networks. Not that that's unimportant, that's incredibly important, but um, is there a way to be thinking more creatively um, on how we might actually be able to implement what has been the number one recommendation of the advisory committee for decades? which is to create clinical centers of excellence so that we can roll this knowledge out into the field and, and train young doctors and encourage them to go into this career and so on. Yeah, it's, it's hard to do clinical centers of excellence when there's so few academics that have centers uh, to even oh, there's start. there's no funding mechanism. Yeah. I mean, okay, I have a center. How do I do yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> just explain yeah. it to me because there yeah. isn't a no, way no, no, no. But I mean, I'm just saying, you know, for <laughs> just spontaneously, we need, we, we need, we need to, to solve the problem of getting academics. We do, them. we do, but it, yeah. you not, you can't do it by saying we need more without yeah. giving them a place to live. When, when, when geriatrics first came out as a field, it was a very underappreciated group. And so the mm-hmm. whole NIH Institute for Aging was born and they created centers of excellence, clinical centers of excellence that had research cores and educational missions, and they created the field, but it was an NIH initiative that created that field. 
So and some little historical notes there. Other yeah. campus the same way. How did how did um, that work? And could we do something like that in and some way? Vicki, are you gonna you want to comment on that? Yeah, but I don't want to step on Mary. If Mary had a comment first, her hand's been up for a while. Go ahead and comment because mine's on a different topic. Okay. Segue. So I was just going to comment that there's a lot we can learn from the rare disease community. Um, I, as many of you know, I worked for more than 20 years in a small nonprofit for the Tuberous Sclerosis Alliance. There are 50,000 patients estimated in the United States. And there are now 30 centers of excellence, clinical care centers across the United States. And we started just by having a few, starting with a key phys physician, most of the time a pediatric neurologist, and then identified the other specialist at that center that those patients needed. So they needed nephrologist, cardiologist, dermatologist, you name it, GI. And we just identified, worked with that one clinician to find those people to develop a clinic. And they function within those centers with no funding from anyone. And so I think there's a lot that can be learned from how rare disease communities have been able to do this, to put in place these multidisciplinary clinics where a patient comes in and you say, you see the primary physician, but then you say, okay, I also need to see the dermatologist and, and there's coordinated care. And this has been adopted as a model, not only for tuberous sclerosis now, but for many of the rare diseases. So I think that there's just a lot of ways that we can approach this. And I fully endorse putting together a working group where we can sit down and put our heads together and say, how, how can we do this and make a difference? Um, the other comment I would make is just thinking about um, early career development and these K awards, um, building on the back of what the Open Medicine Foundation has put in place with these centers at Stanford at Mass General, where there are now multiple physicians involved in the research who also see patients and they could be pulling in young investigators to be working with them to do research, to build a pipeline. Um, and so just really being creative about how we can think about building the pipeline, but also in terms, I think we can't just build the pipeline. We have to think about how can we provide care today for those who need it. I think it's two pronged. Mm -hmm. it, it's really gonna take, as I said, a community and all of us coming together to think about creative ways to do this. Okay, Mary. Thanks, building on what Vicki said, I think it's a good idea to learn from a number of the initiatives that we've been discussed today. And as we're doing that, to also look at whether any of those initiatives face some of the barriers that we talked about here, like reimbursement being a big one. So for instance, in tuberous sclerosis, were they able to set up those function centers with no funding because they were actually able to get reimbursement through the insurance systems? And I think we can also, we also might want to look at what the school nurses have been able to do to um, engage and communicate out to their members. And can we learn anything from that that could be used in some of the medical associations that we need to reach? And then finally, we haven't talked about it today, but I think it'll be really important to look at the state health departments and the state health commissioners and what role they can play. In New York State, doc, um, Dr. Howard Zucker sent a letter out to all the practitioners, clinicians, 85,000 doctors, if I remember correctly, encouraging them to look at MECFS and their differential diagnosis. I think we're gonna th need to think about multi-pronged mm -hmm. communication out to these doctors from leaders in associations and institutes like that that can help drive the change that we need. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, related to that, it, it, we need it to be sustained not just a once and done thing. We need to figure Absolutely. out ways to, to continually get the, get the message out in, in different ways and working together. So um, I, 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 we do, we do wanna um, get to a discussion of the systematic review and the, uh, the clinical trial uh, plans that Vicki uh, had. And um, 
So I do end, so Vicki agrees that a committee might be a good way to move forward. And um, so maybe that's what we should, should try. Vicki, did you have another comment? Oh, okay. Um, okay. So, and I, these, these questions and, and comments uh, that we've generated, I think will be the, a good starting point for that uh, sub, subcommittee. Um, so the topic of the systematic review, I've asked uh, Dr. Nanda Issa from our group to give you an overview of where we're at. If hear me so. this time? Yes, so if okay, you could, if, uh, we could bring up Nanda's slides. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll let you know um, just by saying next slide. Monica, thank you. So good afternoon. Thank you all for attending this work group. Um, my name is Nanda Issa and I um, mentioned before I'm the medical officer here on the team at CDC. And I'll be going over the systematic review of the MECFS treatment that was conducted by Oregon State, or sorry, Oregon Health and Science University Evidence-Based Practice Center. Um, which I'll refer to as OHSU through a contract with us. Um, well, so one of the main goals of our MECFS program is to educate healthcare providers about MECFS to enable timely detection, diagnosis, and management of the illness, ultimately resulting in improved care for patients and reduced morbidity. And you might recall from the 2015 IRM report that there was excellent guidance on clinical diagnosis, but it didn't necessarily address the management and treatment of MECFS. So with the ultimate objective of MECFS treatment guidelines in mind, we set out to evaluate recent evidence related to treatment of MECFS and management of its symptoms. The idea is that once this is developed, the dissemination of MECFS treatment guidelines will help equip clinicians to care for patients with MECFS using evidence-based recommendations. Next slide. Okay, so the current review conducted by OHSU is an update of a review that was previously funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or AHRQ. The AHRQ report concluded that more studies were needed to fill gaps in MECFS research. And the current review differs from the prior review by evaluating evidence for therapeutic intervention effectiveness in children in addition to adults and by considering therapeutic interventions targeting symptoms commonly present in MECFS. As case definitions for MECFS have evolved and some older definitions have in some cases misclassified patients, this report stratifies findings by the definition used for MECFS. Finally, it assesses harms and benefits of diagnosis and treatment. Next slide. We recognize that stakeholder engagement in the early part of the systematic review was critical. So we involve stakeholders as key informants in developing key questions to guide the review. These stakeholders included MECFS clinical and research experts, individuals representing patients' perspectives, and individuals with family members with MECFS. Next slide. The key questions that the informant developed were as follows. In patients undergoing evaluation for possible MECFS, what is the frequency of non-MECFS conditions also referred to as comorbidities? What are the benefits and harms to the patient of diagnosing MECFS versus non-diagnosis? What are the benefits and harms of therapeutic interventions for patients with MECFS and how do they vary by patient subgroups? And subgroups were defined uh, by many things, so defined by age, sex, race or ethnicity, presence of biomarkers, MECFS severity uh, or duration, type of onset, the criteria used to diagnose MECFS, 
and associated comorbidities. These therapeutic interventions targeted symptoms commonly present in people with ME-CFS such as poor sleep, orthostatic intolerance, pain, fatigue, cognitive problems, depression, multiple chemical sensitivity, gastrointestinal symptoms, and urinary symptoms. Next slide. The current systematic review completed by OHSU's search publications through January of 2019. Data sources included OVID Medline, the Cochrane Central Register of Controlled Trials, Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews, PsycInfo, and Embase. The draft report has been cleared by CDC, and to collect comments, we plan to use a federal register notice, which is going through a separate clearance process. The final report will incorporate the comments from the public through the federal register notice and from the peer review conducted by OHSU. And new studies that are identified from an updated search in 2020 will be incorporated in the final report. Next slide. The bottom line of the current systematic review was that since the last review, there have been essentially no therapeutic advances in ME-CFS as there was very little information on the treatment and management. The new information was limited to the following two major conclusions. There was such limited evidence on medications that the reviewers could not draw conclusions. And there was limited evidence on exercise versus other active therapies. The studies did indicate that exercise probably has a positive effect on the fatigue in adults compared to usual care or passive therapies. However, no evidence to support the applicability of this finding to patients diagnosed with case definitions other than the Oxford or Fukuda criteria was identified in the literature review. So the final take home message is that more clinical trials are needed to provide an evidence base for treatment of MECFS. Next slide. As far as next steps go, our team will initiate public comment phase through the Federal Register Notice, as mentioned before. And after finalizing the report and posting it along with its comments on our website, we will revisit plans for the treatment guideline development. The CFS Advisory Committee, or CIFSAC, was considered a Federal Advisory Committee, or FACA, option for this treatment guideline development. But in September 2018, CIFSAC was dissolved. And after that, we were unable to identify another FACA option. But we did consult with many experts in the agency and we learned that a non-FACA route was the most viable option. We've considered organizing a guideline working group, which would comprise federal experts from multiple disciplines involved in the development of clinical guidelines from patient representatives to clinicians, to methodologists, to name a few. It's important to note that using this option means the guideline working group has to be made of only federal employees who could elicit outside opinions, not only through an, a federal, um, through an FRN, but also through an open workshop forum. After the working group develops this guideline draft, another federal notice, register notice could be posted to solicit comments. But given the current situation and conclusions from the most recent systematic review, Perhaps it's not quite the right time to start developing federal clinical guidelines for MECFS. In our consultations with experts, other alternatives like compiling expert opinion have been discussed. Next slide. And on that note, it's worth pausing to consider that the landscape has changed since we started this process. There have been a number of clinical guidelines or recommendations put together by experts since the systematic review process was started. And it's important to note that in the absence of systematically collected evidence, these guidelines and recommendations are based solely on expert opinion. These include a primer published in Frontiers in Pediatrics on MECFS diagnosis and management, a handout for clinicians on the basics of diagnosis and treatment put together by the US MECFS Clinician Coalition, and updated guidelines from UK's National Institute on Health and Care Excellence expected to be available this April. Next slide. So thank you for your attention and we look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, so we, 
uh, we felt like this was really impetus to talk about the situation uh, with clinical trials and in, in discussing the, the situation with uh, Vicki, uh, she thought it was timely to discuss the, uh, her thoughts and NIH's thoughts on uh, clinical trial design and workshops. So Vicki. Yeah, thank you. If you can take the slide down, I don't have slides. Um, so uh, more than a year ago, um, the Trans NIH MECFS Working Group discussed organizing a workshop to bring together people to talk about the barriers um, and challenges to doing clinical trials on MECFS and what could be done to change that landscape. Um, that then COVID hit, um, and so the, our attention was diverted to lots of other things, especially long co or COVID and now long COVID. <clears throat> Excuse me, but we the workshop is back on the table, and I think very timely in terms of thinking about um, how how do we go about putting clinical trials for MECFS in place, and um, a back. A year ago, we had a call, we meaning um, a few of us from the working group, had a call with representatives from the FDA who were going to be very involved in the workshop and we would make sure that they were involved again because several of the things they pointed out was number one, we don't have a biomarker that can clearly identify and diagnose individuals with MECFS. Secondly, we don't have objective measures to look at progress of disease and response to treatment. So as many of you know, Amplogen, there was significant improvement on the clinical outcome that they utilized for that clinical trial, but the FDA felt that it was not um, clinically significant to the patients and that the Amplogen at that time was not approved by the FDA as a treatment for MECFS. So our FDA colleagues pointed out that we really have to have objective clinical measures going into clinical trials and know what those are going to be, along with then the last part of this, well-identified cohorts to, and, and uh, the ability to characterize and phenotype the cohorts that are going into these clinical trials such that we have individuals with clear diagnosis we don't have a mixed bag of individuals who may or may not have MECFS. So again, clear clinical, a clear way to diagnose. Um, and so we had at the time also had a year ago, several conversations with the people in um, Professor Fluge and his colleagues in Norway who have conducted clinical trials for MECFS. Um, to learn from them. And they essentially told us exactly the same thing, that they would not go into another clinical trial without having clear biomarkers, without cl having clear objective measurements of, uh, of response to treatment. So our, what we feel is needed is to bring people together at this point and say, if these are the things that are needed in order to go into clinical trials, how do we get there, first of all? Um, and once we have those things, how do we identify, as Nancy was, was suggesting, a clinical trial network who would carry out these clinical trials? And then I guess the last piece of it that I think is maybe more challenging, but I think equally as important, is to understand how we pull industry and pharma into this as well so that they're a partner at the table and thinking this through with us and trying to understand um, what are the clinical trials that, that we could move forward. Um, we, as some of you may know, NINDS supports some clinical trial networks, but for most of those, or I, I said, should say all, there's one called Neuronext that will do clinical trials on neurological diseases. There's StrokeNet, which is specific to stroke, but in all of those situations where there are clinical trial networks, there's a clear pipeline of preclinical to translational to clinical research that's feeding into those clinical trial networks. And so it 
as the trans NIH working group has discussed it, it's premature to set up a clinical trial network without having a pipeline of trials coming in. Otherwise, you're just wasting funding on infrastructure, waiting for a clinical trial to come along. But these are all of the kinds of issues that we really agree need to be, need to be addressed. We absolutely agree there needs to be clinical trials done in MECFS. But again, it's going to take us coming together and really addressing head on what these issues are and how we can overcome them. Um, whether it's research to develop objective measures, we, there's a lot of research going on in the funded collaborative centers trying to understand the pathophysiology that could lead to those biomarkers, um, as well as in other funded research, both from the NIH, from OMF, from research that's going on in Europe. So bringing all that together to try to understand what, what it is we need to put in place so that we can go forward with clinical trials because clinical trials are incredibly expensive. Um, and to move into clinical trials with just some hope that something's going to work is, is not going to happen. NIH tends, and I'm looking at Dr. Koroshetz, I may or may should not say this, but I think going into clinical trials, we're risk averse. We really want to see that there's strong evidence that this clinical trial is going to be successful because you're investing a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of resources into large studies. So um, stay tuned. Um, I'm sure I'll be in touch with many of you about thinking through how to pull this workshop together because it, it was timely a year ago, it's even more timely now. Um, and again, there may be aspects of this that we can piggyback on clinical trials that will be coming through for the long COVID. But um, I think that, that it, it's something that we absolutely need to move on and there's significant interest in, in doing so. And I would love, love to hear thoughts from anyone else about this, but I'm just wanting to, to put out sort of our position at NIH um, and the recognition that we know this needs to move forward. Um, and we just need to do it in the right way that we can, can really move into clinical trials in a, in a smart and efficient way that, that will benefit the community. I see Ovid has his hand up. Can yes, yes, yeah, go for it. Thank you, Vicky. This, this was uh, incredibly encouraging and uh, we would uh, wholeheartedly support this effort. I can only say from, uh, from my own experience of uh, 25 years of developing uh, therapies, mostly in the rare, rare genetic disease space, uh, is that this, this, uh, you know, uh, this challenge uh, is one that you face very often uh, with, uh, um, with poorly understood diseases. I would say one thing which may surprise you, but industry is actually even more risk averse than <laughs> So, um, so this is, you know, this is, this is a familiar situation. The only way to address it would be for ultimately for the FDA uh, to issue what they often do, which is a, a white paper guidance to the industry uh, in which they describe what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, and what is uh, negotiable. And that gives the industry a, a sense of, what, uh, uh, of what's on the table. In other words, uh, what are the endpoints uh, with a PRO, a patient reported outcome, a measurement of quality of life, for instance, is that something that would be acceptable? I think it would have to apply, the FDA would need to apply the, uh, uh, the risk benefit calculation that they do for um, uh, rare diseases, orphan diseases. Uh, I, although epi epidemiologically, MCFS is not one, uh, I think it really deserves to be treated as such. Um, and so if there's anything that we can do to, uh, uh, to support this kind of a workshop uh, from, uh, from the patient community, uh, we're, uh, we're in. And uh, I think you're right, this is, uh, this is something that, uh, that needs to, uh, to happen, uh, and which is why we definitely need to have the FDA be part of, uh, of this discussion. Absolutely. The FDA did issue a white paper, I'm not remembering when, Beth may remember when, but many years ago. Um, but Absolutely, we, we knew, do need to engage them in this discussion, right? Absolutely. Yeah, they, they have an initiative to qualify um, markers for um, 
endpoints in clinical trials. And the promise uh, instrument is, uh, promise fatigue is, is being advanced um, as, as one. It's almost, uh, we've been collaborating with a group that's trying to get it fully uh, qualified as an endpoint. And, um, you know, the work is slow and, um, but it's progressing. So, uh, but I, so I think it's timely to, to totally revisit this. It has been a number of years. Um, so, uh, Dr. Argue, do you have a comment? Yes, I just wanted to mention a few of the ways that CDMRP can kind of help with this de-risking um, clinical trials. Um, we do kind of have some ways in which we can help with this. One is that um, we do offer an award mechanism that does not really require um, preliminary data. It's a discovery award. This is also something that can be applied to for anyone at the postdoctoral level or above. So it helps with kind of that workforce development problem with getting young investigators in. But if um, there is a new idea, they can start there and it has a direct pipeline into being able to progress into a cl clinical trial with an expansion funding option. The other thing is, is that we do offer an award mechanism called a therapeutic development award that offers funding for some of these more boring aspects of getting a therapy through to the FDA, such as funding applying for an IND and just kind of completing some of the pharmacological and toxicology work that you need to do that when you have a potential drug candidate. And then lastly, we are able to fund for-profit organizations. So if there is a pharmaceutical partner that is interested or has a candidate, we can offer funding for them to help to relieve some of the risk from a for-profit company in order to help. And that's kind of, you know, where we help out with rare diseases is to de-risk this for both non-profit and for-profit partners. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone wants to know more about those opportunities. Thank you. And Mary? It's really great to hear about the opportunities that Dr. Argu just talked about. Those That could be potentially very useful. I also wanted to go back to what Vicki said about the preclinical to clinical pipeline that needs to be in place. And I spent enough time in the pharma industry to understand how important that is. But in this case, we don't have that. But what we do have are therapies that are being used off-label successfully to help treat the symptoms of this disease. And it seems like we should be able to take advantage of those therapies and run clinical trials in those therapies to better learn how to assess the improvement that patients are seeing. How do you characterize it? How do you measure it? What do you have to do initially? And with follow-up to really understand that. I understand the complexity of doing that in a disease where there is um, the kind of fluctuation that we see here, but I think we could learn a lot from it. I think the other thing that would be really beneficial in those is that they could be designed in a way where you could actually learn something about the mechanism that would then feed back into preclinical work as they're trying to sort through the basic mechanisms of the disease that need to be that need to be understood. Thank you. Absolutely, and I don't at all disagree with you, Mary. And as you know, NIH supports investigator-initiated wards, and we have said multiple times that investigators should come to us and talk to us about their ideas for clinical trials. Um, we are not going to send out checks. We use the peer review system. Um, and so we're open to discussions and they just, we ha they haven't happened. Um, so we need investigators to come forward and say, these trials need to be done. Let's, let's think about how we could put this in place. Um, you know, we're not going to tell investigators what to do. They need to come to us and tell us that they have these ideas, help us design this. How do we think through how this could get through the peer review system and be a funded clinical trial? Right. I, t I totally understand what you're saying. I think that starting to establish that clinical trials network might help provide some of the support for making that happen. It's kind of a chicken and an egg situation. Sure, absolutely. You need the clinical trialists and people who in place to think through putting the clinical trial in place. Absolutely. Exactly. So can, can I kind of go backwards to the discussion about the 
treatment guidelines um, and uh, our, you know, we'd like some of the other group, other panelists to comment on uh, our suggestion that perhaps now is not the right time to pursue um, clinical uh, treatment guidelines at the federal level, given uh, the, the, that it, the difficulties of having only federal um, employees on the committee and indirect transmission of information and uh, the, uh, that it would be at the level of expert opinion, which is um, expert opinion guidelines are available. Uh, Dr. Yes. Engel, this is Ben Seaborg with ME Action. I, I think uh, from ME Action's position, talking to, to many um, people, both working in the US, in the UK, other places, um, would, would recommend those. Uh, that would be our position. Um, I believe that uh, you know we don't want to simply recycle the old evidence base. We all know the problems with the PACE trial, these other things. And I, you know, I think our, my our core reservations were about from the previous um, evidence review that was done um, when it was revised, that wasn't um, you know, submitted in a peer review journal where it was accessed by people. And I would be very, you know, you know, one of my core concerns is whatever, if something was to come out um, that resets, um, restates the previous flawed evidence base, if it would reify the stigma, the harm, um, and I know, you know, we're talking about like scientific pro pro, um, processes and uh, collecting knowledge and evidence bases, but um, also, you know, the, the practical real world interpretation that, it, that if people don't see a clear reputation uh, and understand the flaws in the, the previous evidence base, that that could do more harm than good. Um, so I would, uh, th those reservations about moving forward at this time before doing more to work to increase the evidence base. Um, and, 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 you know, these are things that we've um, been communicating for the past couple of years that um, looking to the, the clinician experts, or clinician researcher experts that we do have for, um, for, for guidance, what we can know well about this disease and, and treating it. Thank you. Um, uh, Ovid? Uh, you're on mute. Sorry, I should have uh, uh, um, lowered my hand. No, no, oh, no. lower your hand. Okay. Mary, are you uh, lower your hand too? No. Okay. Um, I just want to add to what Ben said, but also yes. reflecting on the comments that came in from the clinicians in the survey, it was really, really strongly reinforced the trouble that they're having getting uptake is that the practices that they have don't match what's in the evidence base. We lack the evidence base. So mm -hmm. trying to, to build on a systematic review and then having only federal employees involved, I think it, it would be much better to look at what other options we have, as you point out, given the changing circumstances. Okay. All right. Um, can, I, yes. can I ask one question, Dr. Unger? Yes. What is that? So, uh, is there um, hearing about a workshop for clinical trials is good is exciting news. I'm glad we're at that point of having that discussion. Um, you know, and uh, we want to be at the point place of like pursuing a biomarker. Um, given all these uh, you know challenges we're facing now, is is there um, where are we at in terms of um, clarifying? Is there interim work we can do to um, clarify the instrumentation that we use for selection? patients for clinical trials, for this research, yes. um, that, uh, that, you know, for patient recruitment selection methods, can we use yes. some of the, the knowledge that, that, that exists in the expert guidelines to, um, to get some uniformity so that those who may be coming new into this are all using kind of um, our best knowledge at the time of how to... Yeah, that's a, that's a really, really good point. And that was really the hope of our uh, at least partly the, the Common Data Elements project that CDC and NIH uh, did together. We've gotten to a certain point with that. Um, I think what's missing is we've got the measurements, we don't have the thresholds. Um, in other words, to meet any particular criteria, we don't have recommendations on what those thresholds would be. However, I feel like um, the data should be available as people start as you know, they can use these instruments and we can start trying to establish what, what is the threshold, what is the best threshold for um, 
whichever measurement uh, we're, we're doing to, to say that a symptom is present. And, you know, CDC has some preliminary data um, on those and what thresholds we have used, um, but, uh, you know, definitely more work needs to be done. But I think the key is we need to move away from thinking MECFS is one thing and a clinical trial of MECFS is not going to work. You're going to need a particular kind of MECFS um, and, and target and do this phenotyping um, so that you are looking at either people that are early onset with X, Y, and Z or you know, some combination. I don't, I don't have the answers, but I know that MECFS as a entity is not feasible. I, I, that's my belief. And that there's no, that's just my belief. Sorry. So Charmian. <laughs> that's true about a lot of diseases too. I mean, yeah. even, even Alzheimer's. Yes. Pretty not clear. One you just can't take all of it. Yeah. No, and I, was, I think a good point to uh, try and go after, try and understand what measures would be useful in clinical trials and how they perform before you go into the trial is absolutely necessary. Uh, that's the kind of research that we would certainly fund. Uh, I was also going to make that same point. And there's such a difference in the clustering of symptoms among people with MECFS. And maybe it would be almost a good idea to look at, I don't know, I shouldn't be suggesting this, I'm not a doctor, but one symptom at a time or one system at a time. Mm -hmm. or Things that are going on elsewhere in the body mm. may also be influencing that. It's right. just very, it's a very complex it's, uh, it's, presentation and there are many different phenotypes. It's, it's uh, hard to, I think a lot of the times that we get sort of, um, you know, no real result is because we're throwing a whole lot of different things into the same pot and then nothing yes. stands out. And I, one other point that I just, I, I'm always amazed at how much, how many medications uh, some patients are taking and how that has to complicate the uh, measurements that we're doing and the, and the response to other therapies. And it's, you know, difficult in the patients that with longstanding illness, which is why I think moving, moving our consideration up into the early phase of illness is, is an important consideration. Not that, not that we shouldn't look at long phase illness as well, but um, we may get some different insights if we start earlier on in illness. Um, we are getting towards the end. So uh, Mary, did you have another comment? Yeah, just really quickly, um, mm -hmm. I get your point about enrichment of clinical trials to make sure you get a clear signal coming through. I think that it would be worth a formal effort with the clinicians, a knowledge retention effort, if you will, mm -hmm. or a knowledge gathering effort to understand how they make the decisions when they are deciding that this patient needs a particular medication and yeah. that patient needs another, because I think that could help with enrichment strategies by understanding how they phenotype make those phenotyping decisions in their treatment decisions. Yeah, we had tried a, a little project oh, many years ago called, you know, trying to capture clinician intuition, we were calling it, you know, what sort of um, thought process clinicians go through to take care of their patients. And it was very complex. We had, it was a great idea, but it was difficult to actually get something concrete out of it. But we could just- I think it might idea. be worth trying it again. Yeah, yeah. So any uh, closing comments, anybody from CDC? Dr. Damon? So sure, so I really thanks everybody for a great discussion um, and really sharing ideas and thoughts. Um, you know, also using the Q&A functions and chat to engage others in the discussion. I think we heard some exciting new developments over the course of today in terms of uh, thinking about training and education and workforce, um, some of the clinical trials work that's moved, thinking about moving forward in terms of uh, the workshop. And so I look forward to tomorrow's discussion where we focus more on long COVID um, and updates um, to this community on research activities and cross-agency collaborations. Okay. So, I just add that um, from the United standpoint, I really <coughs> 
really appreciate uh, the folks coming together. And I think we can all, we all honestly see the magnitude of the problem. I don't think anybody's, uh, you know, has, is blind to that. And, uh, and so it's only working together that we're gonna get there, but we're not gonna give up. Nobody on this call has given up. So mm -hmm. just gotta keep pushing forward and, you know, do it together. I think, I think that's, I mean, that's the really good thing about this meeting is you see how, how everybody has different opinions, but you know, we're all, we're all trying to get to the same place. Very uplifting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's like, I have it's like, we have a last comment from. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Charmian, your yeah. last comment? <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to thank the people who've been writing in the chat and the Q&A. We've heard a lot of, we see a lot of patient voices in there as well. And uh, some perspectives that we didn't capture in our presentation, I think all of the input from people who are living with these diseases is really important. And I hope people will pay attention to those. Yes, thank you. Is there any one last question? Cause we have four minutes. <laughs> Christine, was there any one? one? You're on mute. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot. Yes, um, okay. But I think a lot of them, it looks like um, some of our panelists have also been answering. So let me... From the NIH, I'll just say that we would be happy to answer the questions that were in the chat. I saw that some of them were not directly related to the conversation today, but we would be happy to address those questions after after the meeting. Okay, so we'll work on compiling uh, some of them. And, uh... and actually, that, that's a good question. Monica, is there a way to, um, to save all of them that are in the chat and the questions as we're going along or before? Uh, yes, I actually just pinged Courtney and said, after the meeting, I will send you all reports, Q&A, chat, and everything else. Excellent. I should have thought to ask that earlier. I appreciate it. No problem. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I think it's been a, been a great day, and or, I mean, a great afternoon. Just And we'll uh, begin again tomorrow afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thanks, Bye. Beth and Vicki, on your work on getting this agenda together. So, thanks a lot. Thank you.